Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess that'll work. How are you, man? Good, good to see you. Come over here and have something again. Okay. All right. Are you on? Yeah. How are you? Yeah. How about you? Yeah. I had a
Good morning. How's it going? Good morning. All right. They got me on script, Charles. So let me That's right. get myself prepared you know? here. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Annual Board Retreat. I'm happy to be here with everyone to build upon our hard work at last year's retreat in developing our new five year strategic plan, uh, where we spend a large amount of time and effort is to establish our vision and mission, and mission statement, affirming our strategic priorities and also uh, establishing our baseline list of strategic initiatives. And I'm also excited to share that this is, a, this is our first retreat with our two new colleagues, Commissioner Caban and Commissioner O'Keefe. Welcome. I look forward to taking the time to be, uh, oh, I look forward to taking this time to be with my colleagues and, mo and making the most of this great agenda that staff has put together for us. Staff, appreciate that, Vince. Uh, with that being said, to achieve the work ahead of us today, we need everyone's participation. And we do, uh, and as we do so often on the dais, we need to work together and build consensus at this year's retreat. Now, I could reach each and every one of the ground rules. I could read each and every one of the ground rules for, for this retreat, but I won't. Uh, most of all, let's just be uh, conscious of honoring its time limits. As you guys know, I like to run a pretty tight meeting. Like past years, I'm sure we will be courteous and nice to each other as we speak to, to each other throughout the day. So for our new commissioners and for all of us alike, today is the day that we get to say the things that we want to say and, and push forward the things we want to push forward uh, within our community, with, within the framework of the agenda that staff has put together for us. I ask that we be respectful of each other. I ask that we be respectful of the process and be respectful of what staff has put together for us to review here today. Uh, does that mean we have to agree? Absolutely not. But if we're going to disagree, let's disagree in a very uh, collegial way, leaving everything that we have to say here at this table uh, and walking away as good friends and colleagues. We good on that? All right. There's more remarks here. But I do want to take a moment to give my fellow commissioners an opportunity to provide any comments uh, from the outset that you would like or wish. I'll start with Commissioner Minor if he's ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this working? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, glad to be here today. 
can you hear me now? Yeah, All right. you got it. Oh, gotcha. Um, glad to be here today. Looking forward to a retreat. I really love this venue. I think it's going to be a, a really nice, uh, nice day. Uh, I want to welcome our two new commissioners uh, for their first county retreat. And uh, I want to thank the staff for, for the materials uh, for this retreat. Uh, going through this, it's just, once again, it's just an outstanding job. The thing, the, the attachment I really liked was the environmental scan, uh, which was terrific, showing the emerging trends. And so, um, but everything else is, is terrific. So once again, thank you for the incredible job that you all have done leading up to this retreat to help us for today. Uh, and with that, sir, let's, uh, let's get to it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just echo what Commissioner Miner said. Uh, every year when we get together like this, this is my third one. It is, uh, it's always great to see everybody in the same place, uh, representing the leadership of the organization. Uh, it's a, I always take it as an opportunity to thank our incredible staff, uh, the incredible leadership that we have at the county. Uh, Mr. County Administrator, Madam County Attorney, Alan, Mr. Deputy County Administrator, you guys do such a great job running this organization. It really cannot be overstated how, how efficient and well run it is and how many people brag to me about it in the community every year. Um, it, it, we are super responsive to our constituents, to our citizens. Um, if I need something, county administrator facilitates that very quickly through his leadership team. Um, and I'm sure that our new commissioners are experiencing that as well. And so I always take this opportunity uh, at our retreat to just sincerely thank our staff uh, and, and any of our staff that are out there listening, perhaps, uh, in their day-to-day -day jobs, facilitating the work of this county. I want them to know that. deeply about how we want to use the authority we've been given by the voters in our community to address the problems that our community faces. Um, as I was going through this report and as I've gotten to spend more time with staff, um, I really appreciate and love that we get to highlight the successes that Leon County has had that we get to Appreciate that the county strategic plans are specific, are set by the board, and are executed and and, and uh, measurable. Um, you don't see that very often. Um, and then I'll just say that I'm looking forward to later today when we get to proposing or amending strategic initiatives, and I'll have a few that um, I'll bring to to discuss that are are ideally set to maximize the impact on some of the biggest crises our communities face. Um, and I hope that uh, these suggested priorities are the, what I like to call easy money, um, smart investments that bring back multiple returns across different parts of our community. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Um, as you know, this is our first board retreat and I want to thank everyone for being here and in attendance this morning. Thank you for staff for putting together this very detailed uh, manual for us to look through. It was arguably one of the most in, in, informative um, pieces of material I've had since coming on a few months ago. Um, today, I'm looking forward to talking about how we can improve the quality of life in my district and our county at large. I think too often the southwest part of our county um, can be overlooked, and I'm looking forward to making sure that um, the things that we campaigned on are brought to light in today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Proctor will be with us momentarily. He's on his way. Um, <laughs> Is my hand on the team? Oh, I'm sorry. Come, my, vice, my vice chair. <laughs> I forget about you. Goodness gracious. I'm sorry. Long morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, Is my mic on? Okay. 
Uh, good morning to our county administrator, our county attorney, my fellow commissioners, and all of you that are present here this morning. It's a beautiful day that God has given us, and I'm sure that we will be very productive today. Um, and going through the material that was provided by staff, it's a tremendous notebook. I want to thank you all for all the summary of the progress that uh, we have made. And I'm especially proud that even though we just completed our first year, the very first year of our five-year plan, that we have already completed 49% of the initiatives that were projected last year when we had our annual retreat. So I just think that that's tremendous. And I think it's just a compliment to our county administrator, to the staff, to our community partners that, collab collabor that do collaborative work uh, with us uh, so that we can benefit the citizens of, of Leon County. And I just commend the county administrator. He has a knack of choosing good people that make him look good. It makes all of us look good. And it certainly benefits um, the citizens of, of Leon County. Um, at today's retreat, after reading through the material, I'm especially uh, focused on health care for our citizens in this community. Um, and I'm concerned about the visible report and statistics of health care. And it shows that Leon County is above the state rate in most of the areas, and that's not good. Um, and then I remember the Human Services Council, I've seen a lot of the additional statistics that deal with low birth rates, um, infant mortality, maternal deaths, and I'm especially pleased, please, uh, Mrs. County Administrator, that you have focused on health care and that there's a significant amount of material in our language with statistical analysis so that we can focus on it today. And also, the fact that you have some of our health care providers that will be coming, I'm proud of that. Uh, Dr. Robinson and Ms. Freeman and some of our other partners from FAMSI, Florida a and University, and other health care providers will be here to give us firsthand information about the hard work that they do, but also about the fact that we really need to try to move the needle to improve the health care of our citizens here in the United States. And I hope that we can throughout the day adopt some specific initiatives to target the health care disparities that's in in our community. I, I know I recognize that we are the, the capital, Tallahassee, of the state of Florida. And it doesn't make me feel good that our numbers, as it relates to um, the health care of our citizens, are far, far below the state average. So I'm hoping that we can continue to collaborate with our partners, the health department. I'm pleased uh, that. We have analysis from Whole Child Leon, Early Learning Coalition, Help to Start, and many other partners that are concerned about the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. So I expect this to be a very uh, innovative, informative, productive retreat. And I'd like to just thank everybody for their hard work in putting this together for today. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, as I wait for our senior state commissioner project to come up, um, you know, I, all the comments that you guys made were very valid. I, I look forward to concentrating on all those things that you guys spoke about. The only thing I can add is, um, as I haven't, there's, a, there's been times I've mentioned it, but I haven't really pushed as hard for it. Uh, sports tourism is, is, is booming all across our country and it'll forever be a market that, that will boom because kids will always play some sort of sport and kids will, and those parents and those teams will want to travel. I think we have a tremendous opportunity here to uh, continue to look at 
continue to look at the possibility of us uh, uh, investing in our in our sports uh, tourism infrastructure to make sure we have what we what's unique and what would make us marketable to other areas, uh, uh, other sports and, and and folks who are looking to uh, travel for sport. Uh, one of the things that we've done best, I think, is the cross country track that we have out there. The investments we, that we put in it has shown great uh, revenue back to us. And I just think there's other opportunities for us to do as well. Um, and I think I won't call her up today, but at some point, you know, Carrie can speak to um, just how other cities and uh, towns are doing in the state of Florida and across the nation when it comes to investing in their facilities and making sure that they have proper facilities and what kind of return they get from that. Now, of course, the big question is, where does, where does the revenue source come from? How do we pay for these types of things? Uh, 3P partnerships and things like that are, are some things on my mind because I don't think we could put all of this by ourselves, but I think we need to get serious about it, real serious about it as we look at what we're going to do in different parts of town and how we're going to continue to grow and, and uh, be vibrant as a community. Mr. Proctor. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The floor is yours. Thank you. Commissioners, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, looking forward to today's meeting. Uh, grateful to start off with uh, the recognized uh, world's best staff and leader in the world. And um, it does a lot to get out of uh, the bed knowing you're going to work with uh, high-grade staff. Um, lastly, commissioners, we have this chance this morning uh, I believe three or four of us were just fresh off the campaign <clears throat> trail. We have uh, permitted to attempt to do certain things. And I think that today gives us that open uh, chance to foster an amalgamation of ideas to uh, uh, synthesize those things that will work, that we're able to accommodate uh, the commitment that we've, we've, we've made to uh, um, citizens. It's my hope, uh, Mr. Chairman, that um, at some point today we will revisit the, the earnestness with which I desire uh, urgency on the fairground. Um, it's my desire today that we uh, consider the Woodville uh, Road widening, uh, the Gale Avenue up to uh, uh, Tram Road, and we still have this albatross of an idea to put a roundabout to make that a one-way pairing of Adams Street, Monroe South, uh, which is wrong. It's my hope today that uh, we can assign a moment or two uh, to partner our thoughts on uh, Crawfordville Road from C 363, uh, the Walk of the Springs turn off, down to uh, uh, Wakulla County line which commitments were made that when Walcolla stepped up their game, uh, that Leon County would step theirs up too. Uh, they've done that, and I'm hopeful that we can spend time uh, in those areas. So uh, looking forward, I'm grateful. Uh, I come from a tradition that on Sunday mornings, uh, some deacon would say something to the effect of, uh, uh, thank God for the blood that runs warm still in my vein. Uh, thank him that the bed I woke up on was not a cooling board. Thanking him for clothing me in my right mind and that my golden moments roll on a little while longer. So here we are together with golden moments. These are, they're rolling a little longer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Proctor, uh, especially coming off of uh, the time you just had over the past couple months and the journey you got ahead, we want you to know that, that we appreciate uh, what you bring to the table in, in your senior statesmanship in this board, in this body, uh, and all you've done for Leon County, not just over the years you've been here, uh, but in the years to come. So we're glad to have you back. We're glad to see you, see you healthy. Uh, we look forward to, to hearing all the good arguments you're going to have on behalf of District Board today. And Mr. Chairman, I thought I had some seniority and I thought that, um, these strawberries and cantaloupe and grapes and pineapple were here, but Chassie just pulled them way over the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, seniority. Well, I tried, I, tried, 
I tried to get Commissioner Caban to make me a play. We kind of looked at him strange. Um, <laughs> You're not sitting by the attorney by accident. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, can we give Commissioner Proctor a hand for, for making it back? Oh! That's a beautiful thing. Um, also, a couple, couple more things for me, public safety. Um, we got to get into a position where we're giving our, our sheriff and his folks the best the best chance to recruit and retain the best talent that, that he can find across this state and even within uh, the city of Tallahassee and Leon County. And so looking at some point to have a conversation maybe later on about uh, continuing to work with them on their pay structure and becoming more competitive uh, or as competitive we can, as we can be when it comes to uh, recruitment and retention of, of public safety professionals here in Leon County. Um, affordable housing, of course, you guys know, this is a big thing for me. Um, looking at what Orange Avenue Apartments and Brenda Williams have, has done and what's coming to that area, uh, one more step we can take forward is, is, is really digging into our inclusionary housing stuff and also mixed housing development, income housing development, to make sure that we're creating neighborhoods that, that has a diversity when it comes to that to, to income uh, and uh, inclusionary pieces there. And last but not least, <clears throat> during the pandemic, our nonprofits helped us out so much. Uh, they were a big part of the solution with us dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, and as we continue to, to deal with issues with crime and things like that and trying to find things for our kids to do and stuff like that, I think that we really need to make sure that our outcome measures are ones of such that are fair to our uh, grantees, but also productive for our community. So digging into that, looking, what, looking at what that looks like uh, will be something I'm looking for in the future as well to make sure we're maximizing every single dollar that we send out when it comes to our CHSP uh, spending and our discretionary spending, because we don't, we don't, we'll never have enough money uh, to fund everyone. And so every dollar, every single dollar counts. We have to make sure that uh, we have met. Now I hand it over to the county administrator to get it started. Wait, administrator? Well, good morning, commissioners. I, I mean, I'll tell you, after hearing, um, some of your your comments about county staff and the, so a lot of the new ideas and the excitement. Um, now the only thing I can think is if, uh, Mr. Chairman, if someone could uh, move that we adjourn at this point, and I think that, uh, no. uh, commissioners, good morning. Uh, I'm kidding. I mean, this is a this is actually a day that we get real excited about. Um, uh, on the, as your county staff, we uh, it's a day that you know, commissioners, that we. Um, pause uh, just for a moment away from all the competing and urgent issues of the day. Uh, and I want to note, to really bring the point home, Alan has just one pen today in his pocket. It's usually, it's usually, <laughs> Alan usually has two pens, but you know if it's just a one pen day, it's very informal. Keith Bowers isn't wearing a bow tie. I mean, you guys you get the you get the, the point here. Uh, but again, we take a pause again from all the competing and urgent issues of the day to take a step back and evaluate our progress uh, on executing the board's larger strategic priorities. And because we do this every year, this also gives us an opportunity to make sure that the county continues to be in the best position possible to adapt to new opportunities and challenges that we face. And that's it. I mean, that's our that's our strategic uh, planning process in a nutshell. That's what today uh, is all about. Uh, however, uh, I will provide a little bit of an overview um, in just a moment about our strategic uh, planning process. And we'll talk a little bit more about how it continues to be key uh, in our ability to, to continue to be able to produce results on a daily basis. Uh, how uh, it continues to help us move the needle on some of those, again, those bigger, larger, bolder issues that, that we undertake, um, and how uh, it continues to help us as an organization be capable of uh, responding to those things that you can't fully plan for. And as you know, commissioners, we get more than our fair share uh, of those. Um, but commissioners, uh, as those of you who've been through this process know, 
Uh, and, and for our new commissioners, you'll be very happy to hear uh, ours is not a um, an overly uh, rigid or, or uh, academic process, and it certainly does not produce um, a plan that sits on a shelf and, and, and collects dust. In fact, you need only look around this very room today uh, to understand how the direction that comes out of this retreat uh, and the strategic focus and the alignment of resources that then follows in executing our plan, how that yields really tangible results. So this beautiful 11,000 square foot community meeting space, uh, which, which doubles uh, as the premier support space uh, for an amphitheater in the Southeast, um, is the direct result of the strategic priority uh, that the board placed in previous retreats on creating an amphitheater that could attract and support headlining acts, a strategic initiative. And it also uh, would advance our efforts uh, in growing our local tourism economy, a bold goal of ours. So you sort of you see how this all uh, fits together. Uh, and throughout the day, you're going to hear examples, commissioners, many more examples of projects and initiatives uh, like this uh, that are benefiting from that strategic approach uh, in our new five-year uh, plan. Um, uh, but that's why today's uh, location uh, is so um, fitting and really uh, very affirmational. So uh, as the chairman noted, uh, today at lunch, we're even going to ask Carrie Post, uh, who can never seem to inf find the uh, right level of enthusiasm uh, to talk about these things. We're going to have her uh, talk a little bit about uh, how this space uh, is uh, doing exactly what was envisioned. Uh, so before we dive in, let me just take a a quick run through uh, of this agenda before us today. The retreats, uh, as you can see, commissioners, is uh, divided into a few sections. We're going to start off with an overview uh, of the county strategic planning process. Uh, that will include a high-level overview on the, our progress to date uh, on our first year, uh, Comm Commissioner Cummings, on the, of the five-year plan. Uh, after that high-level overview in Section 1, commissioners will move on to Section 2 that uh, we'll go into just a little bit more depth on how we execute our plan. I want to talk just a little bit more about that even right here at this moment. We thought we, with two new commissioners especially uh, that this would be beneficial uh, to do as part of our uh, agenda today uh, to highlight just a couple of examples of strategic initiatives that are ongoing uh, currently um, to give those a, a little bit more color so that the board could really get an understanding uh, of, the, of the level of effort uh, uh, of those initiatives that are currently in progress. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And, and the reason we do that, too, is because oftentimes when I come to you and provide you an update, I talk about a number of initiatives and the percentage of the, those initiatives completed and that sort of thing. Again, we thought it would be really beneficial to highlight just a couple of those. And the way we're going to do it today is uh, in our four strategic mm -hmm. priority areas, we just picked two initiatives uh, and we're going to have you here directly from the staff who are working on those initiatives, give you the opportunity to engage directly with those staff people um, on that or, or any other issues that you have. But again, it gives you it'll give you a great understanding of the collective effort, and the alignment of resources that go into these uh, uh, strategic initiatives. Uh, in Section three, commissioners, again, as noted earlier, we've got our uh, update on community health um, from county staff and our community uh, health care partners. Uh, this was requested by the board to be included uh, at today's retreat uh, to focus on the health care needs of women uh, and children in the community. Uh, but it also provides us an opportunity, commissioners, to talk about our longstanding uh, role in uh, ensuring that our most vulnerable uh, low-income residents uh, have access to quality health care in the community. And of course, uh, that's only possible uh, through the partnership that we have with our community human services uh, or health care partners. Following uh, lunch, commissioners, uh, we'll conclude the day as we always do in our update years uh, with um, uh, adding or amending on our strategic initiatives for our 2023 plan. So with that, commissioners, I'm going to run right into our uh, st strategic plan overview. It will be mercifully quick. Uh, uh, let me just uh, start by saying, uh, obviously, commissioners, the county's strategic plan is um, essential uh, uh, for us in how we, you're going to hear me use this term a lot, align our efforts throughout the organization and how we optimize resources and make adjustments as con conditions change. Obviously, that's very important for any high-performing uh, organization. But it's critically important uh, for us, as uh, we have, and as you all know, 
uh, have an unlimited number of issues uh, competing for finite resources. Again, you know that very well. And that's probably why we place more emphasis on strategic planning um, and our strategic planning uh, than, than most organizations, uh, public or, or private. Um, and the team in the room today can attest uh, that this is critical in our ability uh, to manage the everyday delivery of services, to the 100 year storm event, to the generational event that we deal with. And so again, you'll hear from them uh, a little while, uh, in a little while. Um, and, and even though we have a great team, and I would humbly say the best, um, it takes more than a great team, uh, as you all. It does take uh, a, a lot of strategy uh, to be equal to the issues that we face in this community. And I know you, you know that, commissioners. Um, but it requires that we reflect this strategic approach uh, through all of our strategic processes. And I probably can't put enough emphasis on this as you look at the alignment there before you. And, and for commissioners Caban uh, and O'Keefe, you know, that you'll, you'll become very familiar with this graphic. The, the circle of life, as Alan calls it. Uh, but, uh, but, but again, um, you see this strategic alignment through how we budget all the way to how we evaluate each and every county employee. You see it reflected right down to every agenda item that you receive uh, from us uh, and how these things all align with our strategic plan. And you won't, you won't find that uh, in many organizations. Um, but because uh, uh, it reflects uh, our continuous process, uh, again, it provides clarity and focus uh, and intention uh, to guide all of the collective efforts of our county employees. And as you can see, um, this process is implemented systematically and continuously, starting at the top of the circle, uh, which is where we find ourselves today. Uh, at this time each year when we review our progress and explore new opportunities um, and to set the direction uh, for the year round alignment of frankly, uh, uh, countless efforts uh, performed by uh, hundreds of employees uh, across dozens of divisions that do really different things, as, as you all know, engaging thousands of citizens. So again, uh, you get the idea. And of course, this graphic is just the quickest way to illustrate uh, that alignment uh, in our strategic planning process. So as for the plan itself, let me just quickly run through a couple of the big moving parts of the plan. Just again, a, a bit of a refresher. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the second year uh, of our uh, five-year plan um, as developed at the board's uh, retreat last year. And as such, uh, the board established a baseline uh, with that uh, new, new five-year strategic plan uh, last year uh, the, where, where uh, we established the county's vision and the mission statement, the strategic priorities, of course, in that, mm -hmm. in that plan year. We do a very deep dive, as Commissioner Miner noted, on the on the environmental scan and take all that information into account in doing that. And on the screen, commissioners, you'll see the county's vision and mission statements. We'll spend a lot of time on this, obviously. Again, this was set for the five-year term, but uh, but it, it always bears repeating. Uh, our vision statement is, is a county that is safe, healthy, and vibrant. This mission statement also describes uh, how Leon County in an ideal state should look in the future. Um, the mission statement uh, to uh, efficiently provide public services which serve and strengthen our community. Uh, the mission statement, of course, supports the vision and serves to communicate our purpose uh, in the direction to employees, citizens, vendors, stakeholders. Uh, the mission statement reflects um, uh, the, the vision, but of course, it's more concrete and more action oriented uh, because these, again, were adopted in our five year plan for today. Uh, we, we don't anticipate uh, changes up next on the screen, um, uh, uh, as well as um, uh, on the boards around the room. You'll see our four strategic priority areas. Uh, commissioners, our priority areas are high level categories that clearly articulate uh, the county's uh, uh, wishes to achieve uh, what we count, what we wish to achieve uh, in these areas uh, that are so critical to the success of our community. Um, as part of the development uh, of these priority areas in previous years um, uh, and the current strategic plan, again, these were all uh, uh, readopted with some changes last year. Uh, but just to highlight them, the economy, the environment, quality of life, and governance, we'll talk a lot more about uh, those as we as we move ahead today. And those, of course, come with additional directional statements, which you see under each one of them, which provide additional uh, focus and clarity and specificity 
as it relates to, to our efforts and to the role of the county in dealing with these issues, which of course is very important as we plan. Next on the screen, commissioners, again, I told you I'd give you a high level uh, overview uh, of, of how we're doing just in the, the first year. Um, uh, commissioners, our strategic initiatives uh, are, 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 are specific uh, action items uh, that align with our strategic priorities. Uh, and how we carry out these strategic priorities as reflected on the screen. Uh, the five year strategic plan currently has uh, 43 strategic initiatives uh, with 22 of those 43 complete and 21 initiatives in progress. Now, because we say they're complete, it doesn't mean they're done. <laughs> so a lot of these, these, these projects that are included in that complete section may continue for a year. They may con continue for the term of the strategic plan. They may continue in perpetuity, depending on what program or initiative uh, is behind that. Um, so uh, in your retreat materials, let me just note, beginning on page 93, contain a detailed analysis of each of the strategic initiatives uh, that were completed to date. Later in the day, again, the board will consider amending uh, additional strategic initiatives to the five-year plan. Just to round this section out, commissioners, uh, again, a, another one of the really, uh, a couple of the really important critical sort of moving uh, parts in uh, our plan um, uh, are our bold goals and targets. Uh, these targets and bold goals, uh, uh, again, were established um, uh, in the new five-year plan, um, which means uh, that the data presented today uh, represent, of, of course, our, our progress uh, on the first year of activity. Um, as seen in your retreat materials and, and as uh, on boards around the room, we're currently on track uh, to achieve uh, these targets and bold goals over the course of the five-year plan. Uh, as you may recall, commissioners, the goals and the targets, uh, again, are aligned with each of the four priority areas. Um, our targets are important because they communicate uh, not only to staff, but also uh, to the public. Uh, the specific results we expect to achieve uh, uh, collectively uh, through executing uh, on our strategic initiatives. Uh, our bold goals uh, are a little different. Uh, they were at These bold goals are something the board thought in, in, a, in a previous year, not too long ago, was important to really stretch, to really stretch ourselves. Why we think we're gonna make progress sort of incrementally over a period of time on a lot of the things we do because of this alignment of effort and everything else. These really uh, require us to look for new opportunities, look for new ideas uh, and, 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 real, and we don't know that we're gonna achieve these things. It really requires to throw deep and that's why these bold goals uh, are, are such important stretch goals for us. Uh, the targets and bold goals, uh, again, uh, just very, very important to us. Um, uh, let's see, we, again, we track these goals and targets very closely, scarily close, as you can see from your materials. And on page 104 uh, is a detailed analysis on every target and, and every bold goal. process and our progress to date uh, in the first year of our five-year plan. Uh, now let's get on to the good stuff. Uh, um, you're going to hear from our team, like I said, uh, to provide, again, I want to make sure we're clear about this. It's just a couple of initiatives uh, in each of our priority areas um, and, and how they're being effectuated across the organization. Um, at this point, commissioners, again, you'll hear directly from uh, these folks in our organization, uh, they'll provide a, a just a, a glimpse into the collective effort, the alignment of resources for each and every one of the strategic initiatives. Uh, and as you'll see, um, we have staff um, presentation plan, presentations planned by our strategic priority areas, uh, starting with the area of the economy. Very quickly, commissioners, uh, uh, following staff's presentation will provide Again, time for uh, commissioners to engage with these staff people. Again, very informal process uh, today. So we encourage you to do that and ask any other questions that you might have. So starting off with the area economy, uh, as mentioned earlier, there are nine, currently nine strategic initiatives in the area of the economy. Um, and um, uh, we picked just a couple to highlight. First, uh, we're gonna hear from uh, a couple of the, the the best in the biz. I said he wasn't wearing a bow tie today, folks. There he is in his retreat 
And for, it's a rare day uh, when you do. His wife told me he sleeps with one in bed. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, we got uh, Keith Bowers up. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, commissioners, I welcome Keith, our director of the Office of Economic Vitality, to start us off. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Keith, give me a second. So, commissioners, we're about 17 minutes behind. I fully intend for us to get back on schedule sooner than later. Um, if we are not back on schedule by 1030, I'm going to fly right through that break and try to get us uh, to our lunch a little bit earlier, if that's okay. Um, so, Keith. Uh, good morning, commissioners. And I'd like to thank um, Vince and his team for inviting me to share a few highlights of the meaningful work that he's engaged in following the guidance you commissioners have laid out in Leon County's strategic plan for economic development in our community. As you know, our, your strategic plan covers everything my team and I do on a daily basis from recruiting Amazon to open a 2.8 million square foot fulfillment center on the northeast corner of our county to providing funding to the grocery store on Alabama Street in Frenchtown. Everything from capitalizing micro loan programs that provide funding to minority and women owned businesses to strengthening our local manufacturing industry. All of these initiatives are covered by, all of these activities are covered by initiatives outlined in your strategic plan and guide our focus of work. Today, I've been asked to amplify one of those initiatives, but I wanna make this point first. When our team leans into and achieves just one of your strategic initiatives, the positive impact derived from that effort has a force multiplier effect throughout our entire ecosystem. So with that in mind, I'm going to focus on strategic initiative number four, supporting magnetic technologies, supporting the magnetic technologies task force. As you know, Leon County is home to the world's most powerful research magnet. That strategic, this strategic initiative supports growing ec a powerful economic ecosystem that is centered around that global asset. <clears throat> we have some great success. Our team in collaboration with our community partners in higher ed and research and technology have been actively building a cluster of businesses centered around the dynamic innovations that take place at the MagLab. We have an active task force. We are making and taking the lead on a marketing campaign to brand Tallahassee Leon County as the magnetic capital of the world. And we are actively recruiting companies that can benefit from being located near the Mag Lab and Innovation Park. We are at the one year mark of the implementation of your strategic plan and we are already starting to see fruits of our labor. Our efforts this past year led to the recruitment of Philips, the world's third largest MRI manufacturer, who will begin utilizing the vast assets at the Mag Lab to conduct research to refine their MRI technology. In addition to Philips, two more companies with MRI, MRI divisions have expressed interest in conducting research and development in our community. But keep in mind, the success of this strategic initiative has a ripple effect on other initiatives outlined in your strategic plan. With that, I'm available to answer questions later, but first I wanna make way for my good friend and colleague and presentation, presentation partner, Terry Post from the Tourist um, Division. Thank you. I'm sure we get to that point. If anyone wants to make a comment, try a question, just put that little card up and I'll know. Mr. Chairman, don't let us come. <clears throat> yes, please. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And my name is Karen Post. I'm the director of the Leon County Division of Tourism, also known, of course, as Tallahassee. And while tourism works on a number of strategic initiatives, um, this morning I'd like to highlight just one. Um, but before I do, um, I want to briefly share um, an overview of the division, particularly for the, the new commissioners, and then share two upcoming game-changing projects to grow the tourism economy, which is our bold goal, um, and to increase visitation to the destination. So the Little County Division of Tourism, Visit Tallahassee, operates as your destination marketing organization for the Tallahassee Leon County area. We advertise and promote visitation through advertising and marketing, direct sales to sports groups, to meetings and conventions, to leisure groups. 
Um, we uh, sponsor festivals and events. And we operate a visitor center right down uh, on the plaza level here at Cascades Park. And last year in 2022, tourism generated a $1.2 billion economic impact for our community. So indeed, mm -hmm. tourism is a, is a main economic driver in Leon County. So I could talk to you about tourism in Tallahassee for days. And many of y'all know, you know, I definitely could do that. But right now, um, I really just want to briefly highlight two upcoming, very high profile, very high impact projects for the division, again, all designed to increase visitation and support our strategic goals. The first is we will be spearheading, as you all know, the 2024 Tallahassee Leon County Bicentennial, um, a, a year long initiative to celebrate and commemorate 200 years of our era being the capital of Florida. But this work begins now in 2023. So our mission is to engage all corners of the community in order to have bicentennial events monthly throughout 2024. And y'all have to plan in December and you will see through the budget process over the next fiscal, uh, next few fiscal years on how we're going to implement that. So second, the next game changing project is, I'm so excited about this, the tourism operations moving into the newly restored and renovated historic Amtrak building. Super excited about that. The downtown visitor center is located between the two universities in the Orange District and, and where there's also another hotel being built, but it's all designed to better service the visitors that are in market. The whole goal is to get them to extend their stay for at least another day or to have a schedule a repeat visitor, a repeat visit as soon as possible. So the move is anticipated over the next 60, 90 days. I don't know if any of y'all have had a chance to drive down there and check out all the progress. It's super exciting. Um, so MOVE is anticipated within the next 60 to 90 days, and we'll be working with Matt and his shop and CMR to develop, to um, create a, a big grand opening event in the spring. So y'all are going to look forward to that. And it's it's going to be so cool. So now to dig into strategic in initiative number six, and that is to continue to build upon the reputation of Appalachian Regional Park, affectionately known as ARP, as, as we all call it. Um, to, to again, build a reputation of art as a destination for cross country athletes, securing state, regional, and national and international championships. So this initiative for us really focuses our, our resources to expand cross country events that we host at, at ARP. And as we know, cross country events really are the cornerstone of our sports tourism efforts. So we engage with this initiative throughout the year as we continue to build on our relationships with local, state, and national partners. It's all about the partnerships working with the events right holders, again, to secure a, a additional events. And the whole goal in leveraging our partnerships um, with them is to position us as the preeminent location for cross-country championship events. So a few examples of our, our recent work to advance this initiative was in FY22, um, we hosted the NCAA Cross Country Championships out at ARP. Some of y'all were out there, um, which was broadcast live on ESPN. It was five years in the making, took an army of volunteers to pull off, as all of our cross-country events do. Um, and we thought hosting the NCAA was the big kahuna. Um, that is until we submitted our bid to host the world's cross country championships, which as you all know, and I'm so proud to share this past July, we secured the 2026 world's cross country championship to be held right here in Leon County out at Appalachian Regional Park. This will be the first time of <laughs> really, it's, it's an incredible team behind us, the bid team, the parks team, everybody. This is a, a huge, huge effort. But this will be the first time ever that there is a world championship held here in Tallahassee and Leon County. Ms. Post, could I just interject, Ms. Chairman, that we uh, select our chairman to represent our board in the world cross country, and he might have some <laughs> getting in shape right now. <laughs> it takes about seven years. <laughs> Listen, if it was if it was 100 or 200, 400, I got you. Cross country? No, sir. I, I mean, 
Go ahead, Kate. But as you might imagine, I mean, just, I mean securing the bid, um, again, which was a tremendous lift, I think all, all the, my colleagues that were involved in that, but really the real work starts now on that. It is a huge, huge lift. Um, and so y'all will receive an update as part of the upcoming budget process. And it's important to share that we've already received additional cross-country events. We've, we've secured additional cross-country events to be held at our as a result of being a world championship site. So again, there's gonna be more training opportunities and all that. In fact, it's just this past year, we secured 11 additional cross <clears throat> championships. Um, and we hosted several this past fall that were new um, multi-year, which we always go for those multi-year contracts, um, multi-year cross country championships, including the SWAC. Um, Chuck Connors championship out there. And we were so excited to host them out there. And it was, uh, great to hear from them when they said they're staying here from now on. They're not going to go anywhere else for their, their championship. And again, Carrie, if I could just underscore something again, commissioners, before we go by real too quickly, when she says 11 additional championships, don't confuse that with 11 additional events in your strategic plan over five years is to host 80 championships. And so that's what we go after. In addition to the events. Correct. They'll either be state, regional, or national uh, uh, championship events that we go after. We have already, um, again, we're always bidding at, at on the, the again, the, the biggest, and they all want to come here now, too, because then a lot of them that, if they had heard about it, have been here yet this past fall, we hosted two other new events in addition to the SWAC that had not ever been here before. And again, they've heard all about us. So again, we want, but SWAC is kind of close to our, our hearts here with, with Florida and m So again, and we anticipate right now we're in negotiations with six more events that we anticipate securing those this year. Um, so again, I mean, Leon County has worked out with, we are the capital of cross country. Um, and that's the reason we chose to highlight this <laughs> initiative. We have several course. But that concludes my remarks at this point. Um, and Keith and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have on the economy. Thank you, Carrie. You can stay up there. Keith, give me a second. Uh, if you guys don't mind, I'll just flip it up. Oh, up. Oh, stand it up. There you go. All right. Um, that was because put it down. That was, <laughs> um, so, Carrie, uh, I'm so excited here about all the success we've had with our cross country track. It's just not too long ago that we started having a conversation about making the that we that we can uh, sustain uh, what we need to sustain in order uh, for people to want to come here. So if you could just talk about uh, what you see across the state with other um, potential big tournaments and events and things like that, maybe AAU or or whether it be youth baseball or indoor uh, uh, indoor volleyball, that kind of thing. Can you speak to that? Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, we've done several studies over the past few years um, doing a feasibility and a, an analysis here for our destination. It has been a number of years. And right now, we know many destinations have certainly understand that the value I mean, it is, but there's always the question of whether it's indoor or outdoor. You know, today we've been very fortunate to leverage our partners of having the university, the two universities here and TCC, um, as well as city and parks. So again, we, we, our mission over the last few years has been to leverage the, the, the products that we have and the facilities that we have. Um, but again, I think. You know, for one, we would need to do more of a competitive analysis because y'all have heard like Panama City Beach, um, again, which has got sun and fun and they have a, a major sports that they built and now they're working on it indoor. Now they're working on an outdoor. Um, but again, they are also a very different destination than we are. Um, and aside from having a lot more funding, uh, but then you can look at, you know, like even Gainesville. Um, they just built a new facility. It was more of a, an indoor facility, but all over the Pasco County and Columbia County, 
you got to look at what makes sense for you as a destination and then look within the competitive analysis of what's around because it really is destinations of really see there's opportunity and there's pros and cons of each of whether you're, you're, you you want to pursue an indoor or whether you want to pursue an outdoor uh facility and again you know when you look at like sarasota for example they did kind of very niche oriented a lot of what they did uh, but again sarasota panama city you know beach they have their budgets a lot bigger than ours or from a THG collections but um, there are opportunities to leverage private funding, bring in sponsors, et cetera. Um, we recently, it is interesting to note, work with Blueprint when they did a, an analysis for out at um, the fairgrounds to see, and my team worked very closely with them to see again from a, a what enhancements could be made to secure and utilize that that venue for more sports tournaments. But again, there was the the funding that was available, and and you know, there's a lot that goes into, as Keith well knows, selecting a site. Um, a lot of factors that you consider when you select a site. So, again, I think I think we've done a terrific job <laughs> leveraging the resources that we have and the partners that we have, um, and certainly my team in bringing in all kinds of additional things beyond cross country. Um, but I think as far as a, a facility or a complex would go, um, I think we're a very dis different destination than we were even five years ago. And the competitive set has, has changed around us. So I think that would, would warrant some uh, additional analysis. Um, but I think we are, we, we certainly have a reputation in the market for hosting quality top notch right. events. Um, and it's sort of something that the Tourist Development Council has also been talking about the from a sports complex, as well as looking at meeting space. The group business, both yeah. sports and meetings, are certainly um, economic opportunities for us. Thank you. Um, I think back to some years ago when I was having a conversation with the with the Sports Council about us bringing the football championships here. I hadn't been here in a while, and, and our staff was able to go out and make that happen. Uh, and there was so, I'm just, them taking a chance on us because it was during the COVID year, we had to take all of them. They were so pleased, so pleased with the product that we produce here, uh, that they, they continue to bring it here year and year after year again. And I think they're even talking about if we can, you know, have the right kind of facilities in place, trying to have the, the three, well, I think number one through three A, but the four through seven A. We just, we just need the right infrastructure. There's opportunities like that. And I'm looking to, to try to fulfill. So care what I would say is that, uh, as we continue to move forward, sports tourism is a big, big priority of mine. Uh, and I know that we need the facilities in place for you to be able to shop out to those uh, tournaments and, and leagues and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, that facility to me, I think we're missing, we're missing a, a big revenue stream by not really, really investing and digging into that piece of it. I'm going to continue uh, to push pretty hard that we, that we look on how we can give Carrie even more to work with it when it comes to facility and infrastructure, when it comes to sports tourism. Um, Mr. Chairman, you think 27 million could cover it? It, it, it likely could, it okay. likely could. We'll stop. Um, but um, again, as we move forward, I'm gonna continue, absolutely continue to push for that. I'll move now to commissioner comment. Uh, Mr. Commissioner Brown? I think Commissioner Welch was up. I'm sorry, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, First, I just want to commend both of you on the work you do. It is extremely valuable to our community in many ways, whether we're talking about jobs or active recreation or anything like that. Excuse me. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I want to join you in that effort, okay? Obviously, I think uh, it's no secret that I'm very interested in creating or enhancing further avenues for sports tourism. I see sports tourism and sports economic development kind of go hand in hand, whether you're talking about the creation of facilities that can serve as quality of life amenities for the community where people can play volleyball or baseball, softball, or run around cross country tracks um, on the week, during the week. And then on the weekends, we can host economic, you know, events that drive economic development, drive the economy. Um, I think that I agree with what you're saying, Mr. Chair. I think the fairgrounds is a real prime opportunity for us to 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 enter the market for more competitive uh, sports tournaments if we can get them locally. As you know, Carrie, this is a, a sweet spot for me, something I'm very interested in, so I'm encouraged to hear the chairman advocate for that as well. I think that uh, the Northeast Park that we're all aware of, that's obviously a big priority of mine, will 
hopefully be able to facilitate some level of tournament play on the weekends. Um, so that's a, certainly a step in the right direction from Blueprint side. I would like to see the county come up with ways, try to find some avenues where we could enter those markets for those weekend tournaments because there's a lot of money being spent in the markets regional to us. And I certainly understand what you're saying, Kerry, about the dynamics of Panama City and you know St. Joe giving them land to for them to build that gigantic sports complex. And Panama City is a totally different draw. But I do think that Leon County, as we know, we have incredible staff. We have incredibly capable people. Um, and you guys have proven yourselves with the ARP and, uh, and and previous iterations of this commission and this staff, <clears throat> excuse me, have have really turned that into a gym that really really moves the needle in our economy and is something that we can all be proud of. So there really is no reason that we shouldn't at least explore opportunities, funding, you know, locations where we can enhance our facilities or build new facilities that help us attract sports tourism. Okay, so uh, I think the two of you are perfectly uh, situated to work together to make that happen. You two rock stars in your industries, two very capable people who've already, you know, have the mind for that. And I totally realize that there are limitations to what we can do. And I mean, this is Tallahassee and, and, um, you know, we got a lot going for us and, and, you know, it may be a little bit different in Columbia County. They might be able to spend a little more money on a baseball field, but, um, but I get it. Uh, and I just wanted to say in terms of the, uh, the magnetic task force, I think that's a great avenue that we need to explore. Um, obviously that is something that can set us apart from other communities. I know there's been all kinds of talk about, uh, you know, sort of creating this, this science, you know, not creating, but really embracing and enhancing this science community and kind of, get us like Los Alamos out in New Mexico and kind of help that be our identity. We've got all the infrastructure we need to do that. So I'm happy to hear that you guys are pursuing that avenue. And I would like to see us pursue the sports tourism avenue with the same gusto. But uh, at the end of my talk here, I'll just say I am super proud of everything y'all do and everything you represent. The ARP is awesome. I was out there for the national championships. And I mean, there's people here from Harvard. There's people here from Stanford. There's people here from all over the country spending money in our restaurants and staying in our hotels. And, I, and then we got the, the world championships coming. We're going to have people here from Zimbabwe. And we're going to have people here from Jamaica spending money in our restaurants and staying in our hotels. And, um, and that is an incredible accomplishment that is, you know, was done at a facility that no one would have ever foreseen something like that happening. And it is world class to say the least. So thank you for everything that you do. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'm going to join in you on that effort and supporting uh, further sports tourism development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kerry, real quick, you said the landscape has changed a little bit, but it, does, the, does the landscape change enough to warrant us looking at another study or do you think we have what we need? Well, I would say two things have changed. Both our destination mm -hmm. has changed in the last five years when you look at in kind of the evolution of, of our, our tourism product and amenities. And the competitive landscape of sports is many destinations are recognizing the economic opportunity with hosting sports events. And so I don't recall off the top of my head when our last uh, market analysis or what was conducted, um, but I know we did several of them over the years. But it, again, I would kind of say it's, it's a new day after COVID too, you know, kind of everything kind of changed. So it, it could be make a lot of sense to look at the, the competitive landscape um, of in the our market, our region, as well as what our destination now, um, the enhancements that have been made um, in the last five to seven years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Key. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Kerry. Um, uh, you're, you're, I'm sure you're well aware about four years ago, Florida State University built a Greg Norman designed golf course. Um, at the time, uh, one of the main goals was to increase the number of championships that, that are done there. I'm curious uh, if we have collaborated with them and if we are following that, how much um, success we've seen or increase in tournament. It, um, thank you, Commissioner, for that. Yeah, it's exciting to have that course here. Um, our, our challenges, as you know, it's, it's run as a private course. 
um, that's membership based. Um, we have been able to work on a relationship for the last couple of years to host an LPGA um, tournament there. Again, that we have supported and brought here. We hope to continue that relationship. They've also gone through some other management changes over there. So we are always revisiting that because again, when you look at that, you look over Southwood and some of our other courses, Capital City kind of club, we, we are want to develop our, our, um, our golf product and we've been increasing the profile. But unfortunately, like I said, we're limited as to what we can do there, but we are always trying to see if there's another opportunity to work with them. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Meyer, then we're going to finish out with uh, Commissioner Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I, I want to thank Commissioners uh, Maddox and Welsh for bringing up the, the comments about sports tourism. I think that's very important. I think I think Leon County and Tallahassee are well positioned to to con increase our influence in that and, and 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 reap the rewards. One thing I really want to emphasize is is what what Keith alluded to regarding our investment in, in magnetics and high tech and the entrepreneurial sectors. You know, investments in these areas uh, lead to high wage jobs. And um, if we can increase um, uh, the number of high wage jobs we have in this community, it overall increases the median income in, in Leon County, which has a multiplier effect. And so we spend a lot of time, righteously so, on, on trying to tackle affordable housing shortages, on crime, poverty, food insecurity. But there's an, another side of the coin on that. You know, dealing with a lot of these issues that are that our are, are people are struggling with um, directly is 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 necessary and important. Another side of the coin, though, is is helping people earn higher wages, helping increase our incomes, and by increasing our investment in our our tech sector, our mad lab, uh, holding you know cultivating that industry cluster is really important because bringing in those high wage jobs and having more of those then then um, proliferates around the around the community. So I, I wanted to really emphasize that um, because it, some of the best investments we have are those investments that help us develop those high wage jobs. Um, and so with that, Keith, can you go into a little more detail on what you talked about regarding Phillips and the two other companies to the extent that you can? Right. Um, and, and then also talk about what how the efforts are going right now in a little more detail on cultivating that, that industry cluster at the Innovation Park. Sure. Um, thank you, Commissioner Miner, for that question. So right now, um, Toward the end of last year, we had um, some representatives from, from Phillips, their MRI division here in town, visiting with the folks at the MAG Lab. They also um, connected with MAGCOR, which is the division. For um, communities and underdeveloped countries. They feel that there's a potential on the global aspect. If they can produce a cheaper MRI, they could um, do a lot in, in, in terms of um, being able to market that globally. So that is what they are reaching out to um, the folks at the MAG Lab to, to begin developing that level of technology. Um, and forgive me, I don't know a lot about uh, magnetics, but um, also they, they mentioned in our conversation that um, there's a, a helium capture aspect when you're dealing with magnetics. And in some cases it makes it more volatile. So they're thinking if they can sort of begin to, to manage that, um, it will help them produce um, a, a broader spectrum. Um, industry last year was about $8.6 billion. And the, um, it's in, it's anticipated to increase at a growth rate, an annual growth rate of about 5% each year. Um, so all of these companies with MRI divisions are leaning in and it just positions the mag lab as the largest research magnet in the world in a premier, uh, premier position to, to be helpful to all those companies as they look to expand. And Keith, can I just, can I underscore one thing there, Commissioner, that you just said, and, and very, very quickly. The reason that we get so excited about researchers in this space is the way that this sort of works is these companies like Philips send researchers and when the research goes well, then they add employees. And, and so that's, that's why this, that's, that's kind of the way this works in this space. They generally bring in their own researchers, but they move people and they will be moving several researchers from their headquarters 
to Tallahassee with their families. It's a major commitment. And if things go well, what follows that is the expansion of employees. Oh, that sounds great. I mean, because, I mean, if if we're looking at what success at the Mag Lab is, if we're trying to really in, to visualize what that is, it's really two steps. One is successful research, but then the second step, which is also necessary, is commercializing that research to something that's profitable, right? That's what that's what brings in the employees. Um, so that's that's really key. I um I, I thanks for the for the uh, uh, elaboration on that. Really appreciate it. Um, and just to just to reiterate, we've all heard it before, but you know the the Mag Lab is our is our golden goose. Uh, there, there's no one else in the country that has this, and uh, um, you know we have that competitive advantage that no one else has. And so there's a very specific; it's a narrow range right. of companies out there. But those companies really have the, the best place they can come is is Tallahassee and Leon County because right. of the Mag Lab. And and the more that we're doing, it sounds like things are going great, and and things are in the pipeline still. Uh, but that's that's good effort that's going to pay off. So so there is a, um, a magnetics conference taking place in Orlando next month where folks from across the world will be coming um, to deal in magnetics. And uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned in my, in my comments, we have um, taken a lead on a marketing campaign to develop a, a, a sizzle reel featuring the Mag Lab in Tallahassee and all the components that are available to complement that that are housed at Innovation Park. Great. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. Really appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, thanks for, uh, thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Cover. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to commend uh, Ms. Post and Mr. Bowers for their presentations and for the work in those specific areas. Um, in the interest of time, I also just want to uh, echo the sentiments of my fellow commissioners uh, and commend Mag Lab, Innovation Park, and all of the work in this particular initiative that has uh, successfully been completed during this this first year. We have realized some accomplishments uh, toward our our bold goals and initiatives, thanks to the leadership of those people that are before us. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Anything else? There's <laughs> Mr. Administrator, we'll move on to the environment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, uh, Ms. Post, I uh, want to thank you uh, for exciting uh, comments that have been offered. Uh, Mr. Chairman, not only is uh, Commissioner Welch uh, supportive, but you have two votes behind that idea uh, of the sports, tourism, and, and developing our sports attraction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that we need to uh, possibly go to Memphis uh, to visit the site there, which I don't know what meeting it was exposed. I don't know if Mr. Bauer show, showed us uh, sites of Memphis and what they've developed there for sports uh, center. Uh, but I'm willing to get on on the um, I can't get on the plane right now, but I'm, I'll do it virtual if y'all go see about it. Uh, <laughs> I, bet, I bet you would. <laughs> but Chairman, I want you to know that uh, I hate to see that this stays out in advance, uh, this idea that you championed for so long, and it, it becomes an albatross of the, of the nature of a, as, as is the foreground to, to me. Uh, it's an idea that needs to, uh, and uh, I joined Commissioner Welch in um, crystallizing my support. Uh, for us to become more uh, poignantly directed uh, to secure uh, facilities to be a champion in this area. Uh, secondly, uh, I rise and voice this morning to state that uh, there's been no mention, though I know it's one of our strategic uh, initiatives, but with respect to our bicentennial, uh, no report there. But I would like to uh, flush out and not just uh, lift it up, I love to see, um, with respect to our tourism effort, uh, our bicentennial, bicentennial year, uh, our consideration of having a bicentennial, uh, golf tournament, uh, a bicentennial sports carnival, a volleyball tournament, a bicentennial softball. I think we could load up next year with a bicentennial something every month. Uh, I love to see a bicentennial re uh, revival meeting, a uh, uh, gospel uh, jubilee. Uh, 
I love to su support the idea of instead of going to Amelia Island, uh, let's have a bicentennial cruise. Uh, let's put our chambers together and we can do two of those cruises. The county can do a cruise. The city can have a bicentennial cruise. Uh, let's do something um, special. Uh, the FAMU track relay uh, comes here in the spring around March. I think that um, if we did a Tallahassee or Leon County bicentennial track meet with Florida State uh, FAMU intention to celebrate the bicentennial, but we've got to get everybody in play uh, lockstep to um, think about 200. And um, there should be, um, you know, 200 student scholarships next next year, um, 200 first places at the golf tournament, 200 um, uh, volleyball teams. But let's lift up 200 choirs to come to Tallahassee. And all these people coming here for 200 uh, ought to be a goal. We put heads in beds if that's the aim of tourism. Um, let's just take next year. Some of it may stick against the wall and go um, into 25, 26, 27, but um, some of it's just gonna occur as a dash and splash in 2024. But I'd like to offer those ideas that we get excited and put 200 on everything, get 200 people out of jail, you know, uh, 200, <laughs> you, know, you get that. You know, you're talking about I get that. Yeah. Mr. And Chairman, then, oh, I'm sorry. And then finally, um, um, with that bicentennial, we, we, that need to be, uh, 200 families, black families, uh, recognize, uh, coming together. Uh, we need to recognize at least 200 families from old. Um, I think that we could put heads in beds if we had, um, reunions, uh, uh, scattered and coming every month doing something special with these, these old families. Uh, and, those are my thoughts, Mr. Chairman, uh, with respect to tourism. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I just want to, just want to say, I just wanted to underscore what, what Commissioner Proctor was saying. And I, I think probably, if I was trying to think, Commissioner, I think this might have been the, the meeting you were laid up, but we, we just brought a plan back to the board um, for Carrie and her team to head up this whole process, engaging all the folks you would imagine the board um, approved the agenda item. And just like you were saying, uh, Commissioner, uh, the, the idea behind this is events every month for a year that we're doing. And we're going to bring that plan back to you all so you can see it and sign off on all that good stuff. That's all I have. That was one of those instead of sure. <laughs> and, and just a facilitation thing. We also, at the end of the day, you'll start off with initiatives that are pre-populated. That's one of the pre-populated initiatives that will already be up on the board for you to approve today, just to raise it to that level of emphasis. Commissioner Cabana, I was just going to say, Commissioner Proctor, please make sure I'm invited to your bicentennial fish fry. You do know it's covered. We're only going to have 200 people. <laughs> <laughs> you do know it's covered. Um, I, if, if I'm anything else, I do want to ask that um, we consider, and I, I talked to the attorney about this. Um, Ms. Post said we may, be, we may need to look at another uh, new study, looking at the, the past five or seven years. Um, I was hesitant to ask for one because we just keep asking for studies and asking for studies and asking for studies and, and quite frankly, there's money that's being spent and and so I, I mean if, but I do agree that the, the landscape has changed and so what I'm going to ask in a moment is that we look at staff bringing back an agenda item, uh, looking at a new study of the past five to seven years of the market. Uh, and what the feasibility is here. That's my motion. And I'm looking forward to pass with a supermajority. That's a motion. Yes, sir. Second. Uh, any other comment? Yes, when sir. we look at that study, can we look into further ways to partner with our local universities? Potentially there are ways where we could use their facilities um, to save money and be very competitive as we go through this process. Well, let's not just look at the universities, look at the school system as well. All the facilities that we have in town, the partners that we could have, how can we maximize those as well uh, while also looking at what, what other infrastructure we may need uh, to, to make ourselves the most competitive? That's a brilliant idea. We've got 80,000 seats in one facility, um, right. 25,000 another. That, that right. adds velocity to uh, what we index as uh, what we offer. That's right. Any other comment? Uh, just for clarification, uh, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, your motion is directed also to looking at the possibility 
of a facility location, what have you. Yes. And, and I think one of the things that we championed earlier is the fairgrounds. So yes. as part of that study and analysis, if we could consider perhaps the fairground location as well. Definitely, definitely. Any other comment? Any objection? Seeing non insurance passed unanimously, it'll be a part of the ratification, Mr. Administrator, that comes back with you treat. You got it, Mr. Chairman. And just for other such ideas, just a note to commissioners, if, if you have issues like this for today, and, and obviously the chairman's an old hand at this, um, we'll keep track of it, what we call administrative issues. So it's not quite ready for prime time, but something you really seriously want to look at, but don't want to elevate it to a strategic initiative. You want an agenda item to come back. That's just what you do. And we'll keep track all day long of what we call the administrative issues and make sure we bring those back to you. Mr. Chairman, I failed to mention one thing. Yes, sir. If I might, excuse me, Commissioner, not prolong this, this moment. Um, I think Mr. Bowers mentioned Amazon. Yes. Sir. And, um, I had asked questions. Uh, I think that we had time to meet with them, uh, uh, over the weekend. And uh, the three things that I brought to the awareness of, uh, of uh, their representative was the, was the quest and call for an integration of public schools um, and their exposure in a model of um, robotics for our public school uh, children. Also to uh, the ask of Amazon was that an integration of our universities uh, as well as the hiring stream uh, will be focused and targeted from our universities and, and, and their students there. And uh, one of the asks of Amazon, which uh, each of us probably, but it was for uh, their uh, incorporation of 32304, uh, given their being uh, one of the most um, cash loaded uh, companies uh, in the world. Uh, coming to a community with Florida's poorest zip code um, with the underlying edict uh, our adage that um, to those who've been given much and they're valued at over a trillion dollars, uh, much is required. So those were comments that I made with Amazon and I'm hoping that Mr. Bowers was there uh, that we would integrate and we would make sure that their uh, presence would add value to um, the elements of our community. Right. Thank I you. To share that with y'all. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, we're going to end this out with Commissioner Cabana, uh, O'Keefe Cabana, and then we're going to move on to the environment. Commissioner O'Keefe. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't bring it up if it wasn't uh, very important to extend the time. Um, given the county administrator's um, instruction, I think this is the right place for expand the availability of child care to have a positive impact on our available workforce. We hear from our chambers and our business leaders that we are lacking the workforce that we need. And many parents, especially women the burden falls on, are not able to enter the workforce because of the cost and limited access to child care. And so this is an area where um, I think that uh, it would have multiple benefits uh, if we are able to, if we identify a need and are able to expand access to childcare so that parents can enter the workforce, we get a multiplier effect on uh, benefit to children in our community and our workforce. Um, and we uh, also just improve the lives of our folks, but it's mainly under a workforce thing. Because Uh, early childhood daycare could improve our workforce. Motion to amaze our second. All second. Seconded by Commissioner Welch. Comment. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I'd just like to comment and I want to thank uh, Commissioner O'Keefe for that recommendation. Um, I'm a member of the Children's Services Council and we do have our executive director here, uh, Ms. Sika Green. And that is one of the areas that uh, we are chronicling or have looked at, and we recognize that there is a need uh, for assistance with child care, and there is um, a barrier 
to, to many parents entering the workforce because of the high cost mm-hmm. of, uh, of care for their, for their children. And I'm not sure if it's in order, but, um, if it's in order, if, if our executive director could speak maybe one minute on that particular, uh, that particular uh, issue, uh, Ms. Green is in the room, or she was here early. Let me ask you, so, okay, so she's here. Yeah, are you saying that, that this is an initiative that the CSC is already looking at? We, we, we were looking at that, uh, and I think she could shed some light on it in one minute, uh, Mr. Chair. She's here. If Ms. Green could come up, if, if that's permissible, Mr. Uh, Chair. Give me a second. So, so I'm going to tell you as she comes up, give me a second. I might can figure this out without it. Um, what I'm looking at is I'm, I'm looking at what you're asking for, and, and I think, as I remember it, when I was thinking about it, the CSC is looking at uh, this and really studying this already, correct? Uh, what, I, what I was wondering is if um, we might let the CSC take the lead on this instead of us studying it and maybe uh, requesting re- information at a later date from the CSC about where they are and how we can be partners on it, um, rather than jumping ahead and going ahead and doing that study, because I believe they're already doing a lot of that. And so I'm trying to think about your motion, your motion asks that we lead a study with our partners looking at um, how um, child care affects the workforce. Um, what I'm wondering is if, if we can amend that a bit to ask for a presentation to come forth from the CSC so we can see where they are on, on their studying it. And then at that point, um, if, if you're satisfied, ask then for either um, in, increased partnership with the CSC or for exactly what you're asking for now. Uh, because I, I, like I said, as I think about it, I do think, I don't want to jump ahead of the CSC and what they're doing and what they're studying. I would, I would much rather us jump on as a partner much, much, much more than, than try to jump in front of them as the lead. Does that make sense? Commissioner Keith, you got a comment? I do, Chairman. Yes, it makes sense. Perhaps if I narrow the scope and clarify and then get um, more information, um, it might make more, it might, uh, um, make more sense. Um, or, or not. Um, I, I would like to narrow it then and then see if the CSE's, uh, analysis of this is including this part is I would like to focus on staff bringing back, um, an item. Uh, with a brief preliminary look into what other areas have done, specifically focusing on working with area employers to help provide child care from the working with employers if there's interest in partnering with them in some way from an employer's perspective, not solely from a developing more child care, developing more overall access to it. The idea being um, if that is not an area that's part of the CSE's pursuits that we get a brief preliminary feedback from staff, not a, a, you know, a consultant study or anything like that. Okay. Ms. Green, speak specifically to what, to what your study focuses on and how you see the interaction between us and you all. So good morning, just for the record, I'm Sika Rose Green and I'm the executive director of the Children's Services Council of Leon County. There are a couple of things since you asked me up here that I think are going to be important as you contemplate this motion. So number one, really the early learning coalition of the Big Ben probably has a better handle when you're talking about child care and access to child care. So I think they should be a part of this conversation. And we are currently looking at a partnership with them. Number two, I know that the, our, our umbrella organization, the Florida Alliance of Children's Councils and Trusts, are working with legislators now to develop um, an iteration of a child tax credit. And so this would be offered to businesses that incentivize um, funding for their employees to help offset that cost of child care. So I, I don't know that you would want to step into commissioning a study because that's kind of already happening and there is work going on um, on the state level. Now, I don't expect that that will pass this session. I do expect that it will be put forth by next session. Um, but from the CSC's point of view, we've already done a needs assessment. And in that needs assessment, one of the things that came up was access to child care. So we are working with the Early Learning Coalition on a partnership that we are 
preliminarily calling the on-ramp program because with the ALC, we find that we have families that are either making just above what would qualify them for school readiness or they don't have child care to be able to look for jobs or get into school. Mm -hmm. So we are starting with a bit of a pilot program to supply funding to families that are just at that income level so that they can get into the ELC, they can put them into school readiness, and then they have access to that money. The program that we're working on would infuse about $250,000 into that with a return of 2.8 million. So um, it may be in order to just hold off and let's see where we go uh, with the CSC and that funding and if we can expand that funding. And then I would be more than happy to provide an update on how that tax credit is going forward with the legislature from FACT. Thank you and thank you, uh, Commissioner Cummins, for, uh, for, for Vice Chair Cummins for, for bringing that up. Um, so given what I'm he hearing today, I like the initiative, but I can't support the motion. What I'm looking for most and, and even moving forward on this issue, I do understand it's exactly where you're coming from. I think it's an important issue. So much so that I think we, we do a little bit ourselves for our employees when it comes to such things, correct, Mr. Administrator? Uh, so, so we recognize and we try to lead by example when it comes to that. Uh, but on this issue specifically, um, I'm looking more so for the CSC to lead us down this road and, and really paint the picture of what it needs to look like moving forward. So um, it's not just at this, at, at this time, but I don't think at any time I would be willing to look at a study as long as we got a CSC in place. If we did not, I'll be all on board. But uh, with the CSC in, in place, I'm, 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 I want them to be able to uh, drive fast in their lane without us uh, impeding uh, what, what progress by, with our own studies. Now, I do, one thing you said there is how do we partner? And as that, as that study comes back and as they start to talk more to us, um, what does that partnership look like between us and, and our private industry here? And not us just leading by example, but how, how do we express how important it is and, and be good partners to make it uh, more available for them to be able to provide such incentives for their own employees? So it's, it's a great issue. I'm very interested in it, but I want, if I, if I, if, it, if I have my way, I will move that way in it. Commissioner O'Keefe, you want to finish this out? Uh, I'll, I'll amend the motion. Yes, sir. Uh, amend the motion to ask staff to invite the ELC and the CSC to provide an update on this issue right. when they are ready. Perfect. Uh, does the second accept the amendment? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, any other comment? Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to thank uh, our chairperson, our director, Sika Green, for being available, being willing to come and give us a status of that particular study yes. for um, early childhood and uh, the fact that parents do need assistance with child care. Yes. So thank you. If if we can just give her a round of applause Please. for impromptu presentation. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Cummins, she's a baby rattler. I oh, expect oh, fully oh, that she should do that. Absolutely. absolutely. I will say as, as we end this thing out, I want to thank staff for not just having our, our uh, management team here, but also inviting our community partners here. So when these things do come up, uh, we can put them right there on the spot and expect them to perform. So I uh, appreciate staff uh, staff doing that for us. So uh, if we don't have anything, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Minor, then we're gonna, we're gonna move on. Real quick, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Commissioner Keefe, I wanna thank you for touching on what is probably one of the most important things we could do in terms of helping with our workforce, especially with, among our women. If we could somehow wave a wand and make um, childcare more affordable and accessible, that'd be a jump start to our workforce. And so I think you really hit on that on the head. I support the amended motion and looking forward to that report when it comes back. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm yes. curious, and um, Commissioner Welch couldn't share with me because the county attorney was looking at me strangely. <laughs> but um, will there be a cost analysis of what uh, daycare, I mean, is daycare has the needle move in, in, in terms of rising uh, consistent with the price of eggs or, um, or housing? or how, how does it, over the last three, four years, mm -hmm. what are we looking at? Um, is that a part of what you would like? Well, to see at least I'm interested. Oh, Mr. O'Keefe. Commissioner? Eventually, but given the, that yeah. there's another group studying it, yeah. um, I will wait to hear back from what they provide. And then based on that, if there's not that information, you can expect me to, to push for more of that information about the, the and a real analysis of the inflation and cost versus our average income of our families. Okay. But this motion is simplified and scoped down to just bring an update from the other partners who are experts in this field and already doing a study. 
All right. Yes, sir. Commission command. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Keith, could you uh, loop in Commissioner Proctor since we met with Amazon individually um, as commissioners last week? Uh, we discussed with the Amazon rep having a job fair specifically for the 32304 zip code. Additionally, we looked at hosting one down in the Woodville Community Center. And so um, since we met individually, I just wanted to open the floor so we could have some collaboration. If, there's any, if you had any thoughts or input on that. I Keith. Share what, I, what I thought, I mean, my comments were with them. I didn't know if others what y'all wanted to share. Keith, give me a, give me a brief overview. And what we're going to do, commissioners, is I'm going to ask for a slight agenda modification. Uh, we're going to move, since we have our healthcare partners here, we're going to move that piece up. And we're going to finish these strategic initiatives after that. Uh, and so after Keith finishes, and I'm out, everybody, you get one time. Uh, we're going to go to a 10 minute break and then we'll come back to the healthcare initiatives. We good on that? Any, okay. any objection on that? Point uh, word. Have we, do we have a motion on the floor? We, we do. We, I, I got it. Don't worry about it. Um, Keith, you go. Okay. So, um, commissioners, um, we had the, um, Sam Blatt, the representative from, from Amazon, and most of you met with him on Friday. And that was a common theme, um, you know, hosting job fairs and making sure that we focus our efforts in terms of uh, employment recruitment for the Amazon Fulfillment Center, start with the local initiatives. And then we wanted to make sure that we have uh, a, a, a take an intentional focus on um, hosting and OEB will take the lead on hosting job fairs uh, wherever the need is. Um, we, we talked specifically about hosting job affairs um, in Commissioner Caban's um, district, um, Commissioner um, or, uh, Commissioner Proctor mentioned that he would like to see some job fairs spe specifically targeting, as he mentioned earlier, college students. Um, they have internships that are available that um, they would like to roll out, especially for those students who are specializing in logistics and, and management. Um, and, but also just in general. Uh, so we will um, take the lead on hosting those uh, job fairs and recruitment sessions uh, in your respective districts um, to include 32304, um, Commissioner Cabanz, District 2, and um, the South Side as well. So um, they are very amenable to that. And again, we are just in process of now just um, coordinating those efforts um, as you know, as you mentioned during the briefings, the recruitment um, initiatives don't begin until they're anticipated to be anywhere from 60 to 90 days out. That would give them enough lead time to get everything in place. So we're just waiting to hear from, from um, Amazon when we can. Very good. I, I appreciate Thank that. you. Great presentation by Carrie and Keith. We'll move now to a 10 minute break. It is 1044. Oh, yes, yes. I said I will take care of that. Um, I figure there's no objection to the motion. No. Seeing none, show this passed unanimously. We'll take a 10 minute break. We'll be back here at 1055. Thank you. Yes. 
uh, the administrators asked to leave this office as I have commissioners coming back to me. I'm going to go ahead and let him get us started. And then we can uh, move right into this good conversation on our community health. Mr. Administrator, you ready? I am. Thank you very much. You know, commissioners, you were probably all wondering since this meeting started, when do we get to hear from Shinkton Lammy? I know everybody was probably thinking that, right? Was I the only one? I was probably the only one. Uh, but commissioners, again, just uh, just the point in, in our uh, agenda um, where we talk about really one of the county's longest standing uh, priorities, which has been to promote a healthier community uh, through providing access to health care uh, through our community-based uh, um, human services providers. And just as a reminder to the commissioners for decades um, and, and throughout each of the county's past strategic plans, the county uh, has advanced this priority uh, of promoting a healthier community uh, through its support and investment in uh, uh, critical services provided by our local health care partners. Uh, and for the next segment of today's retreat, we're joined by several of those partners and our director of the county's Office of Human Services and Community Partnerships, uh, Shinton Lammy. Uh, to provide the community health update, which again uh, comes from the board's uh, request uh, back just a couple of months ago, following Shankton's uh, presentation and, and that those provided by our partners, uh, will present um, a couple of strategic initiatives, again, in keeping with uh, the agenda today, which will um, help us to continue um, to support uh, our partners and our goals. And with that, I just wanted to uh, say a welcome to all of you, and uh, we really appreciate seeing you here today. This is a critical partnership that we have, and I mean, other than Janae, I get along with everybody uh, that's here. Uh, no, with that, let me just uh, hand it over to you, Shankton. All right. Thank you, Mr. County Administrator, and good morning, Commissioners. I'm very pleased to make this presentation on the county's continued commitment to invest in health care, critical health care in our community. And I'm especially happy to do with the folks around the table who I get the pleasure of working with every day, um, sometimes on the weekend and sometimes on the evenings too. Um, but really important to address health care. Um, this retreat, as you requested, gives the board the opportunity, though, this time to interact with these folks, what I like to call my family, <laughs> uh, in the area of health care. I'll get us started with a brief overview of the county's health care program, plus our annual investment. Then I'll turn it over to each of the providers here at the table. Um, Brandy Knight, who um, is with the Leon County Health Department. Dr. Timbal Robinson with Bond Community Health Center. Janae Freeman with Neighborhood Medical Center. Dr. Jay Reed with Appalachia Center. Pam Irwin and Diana Bixler with Capital Medical Society We Care. And Dr. Gervin Robertson with Families Pharmacy. And each will this morning we'll talk about the organization and programs, the challenges they face with providing health care, and how the partnership with the county helps to address those challenges in delivering health care services essential to improving the quality of life for low-income residents here in our community. I'm also very happy that we have Chris Sorchik with the Capital Area Healthy Start Coalition with us because as we have shared commissioners, in items presented about poverty and food insecurity. Education and awareness is the highest need of improving access to available resources in our community. And the general consensus is the same when it comes to addressing healthcare. And specifically, education and awareness is vital to improving the health conditions, especially in black women and children healthcare. Healthy Start is doing just that actively engaging women to connect them with services to improve health and safety for themselves and their babies. Chris will share how she and her team are doing that and how the partnership with the county through programs like Sister Friends and collaborations with our library system and EMS are making that possible. Following our partnership's remarks, um, as the county administrator shared, I'll wrap it up with the two strategic initiative recommendations in the item that will build on our collective efforts to improve health care and health care access in Leon County. So with that, I'll get started with our county's health care program. For more than a decade now, the Leon County Health Care Program, also known as CareNet, has provided 
access to health care for uninsured and underinsured neon carrot residents that are not eligible for state and federal programs like Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. The county's health care program provides access to primary care like annual checkups, dental services like cleanings and extractions, mental health such as counseling, um, specialty care for things like urology and radiology, and pharmaceutical services for prescription drugs vital for long-term care. This past year, these access to care led to more than 7,000 visits for primary dental and mental health visits, $1.2 million in donated specialty care from, from more than 300 doctors here in our community, and more than 2,500 prescriptions filled valued at more than $100,000. And that was just this past year. For this year, this current fiscal year, the county is investing $8.2 million in partnership with our healthcare providers to support programs, services, and events that provide a safety net of care for the uninsured and underinsured here in our community. <clears throat> but commissioners, I can't stress enough about how important our partnerships are to addressing healthcare needs in Leon County. Our partners, the one you see around here at the table today, they're the ones with the boots on the ground. They're putting shots in arms, they're prescribing life-saving medicines, they're connecting patients to doctors, and they're delivering babies. Again, that's why we're excited to have them here today. And so now I'll turn it over to them, starting with uh, Brandy Knight, our health officer for the Leon County Health Department, who will now provide an overview of the health department. Also a brief touch on the women and children data that the board requested. Brandy. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for allowing this group to speak with you today. As stated, my name is Brandy Knight, Administrator Health Officer for the Leon County Health Department, also known as Leon CHD or DOH Leon, depending on who you're talking to in the county. In addition to being the source of health data for our county, which you have a snapshot in your packet where we highlighted some women, infant, children data for you all as requested, mm -hmm. We work collaboratively with health agencies here and others in the community to provide various services to our residents. We conduct a health assessment, health improvement process every five years. We are in the beginning stages of our current cycle. The intent is to assess the health of our county, then work with community partners and residents to identify areas of improvement and associated strategies. These strategies are not solely implemented by the health department, but all of us collectively and collaboratively. This effort is led by our community health and planning team, who also um, was a key factor in pulling together the data that you have in your packet today. We often serve as a convener to ensure various organizations that may touch a particular health issue are present and accounted for and able to be part of the comprehensive process. As Mr. Lamley stated, we use funds received from the county to support various programs, family planning services, nutritional programs, our dental program for Medicaid eligible individuals, and general health education. With the county's assistance, we've been able to staff a behavioral health navigator position at the health department. This position focuses on specific populations to raise awareness about various services in town. All of our programs, <clears throat> within our programs, sorry, we provide general health education, and screening, such as tobacco cessation, we focus on chronic disease and we, um, screening services for our breast and cervical early detection program. We also have a great school health program. If you have children or grandchildren in our public schools, I'm sure you've seen one of my staff at the clinic with your child. Um, we assist in educating children and parents and school staff to help manage any chronic disease being experienced with a child, such as diabetes, allergies, epilepsy, and or asthma. Um, we help to train school staff on what to provide and immediate assistance, and we conduct health screenings as mandated by Florida statutes within the school system. We work collaboratively with Leon County Schools to do so, and um, we have fully full support from uh, Rocky Hanna and his team there as well. More specifically, um, when focusing on women and children, we have our WIC program, who uh, they do a lot. They don't just hand out uh, nutritional uh, vouchers, as many in the community think. 
but they do provide nutrition and education counseling. They provide breastfeeding promotion and support. They provide um, health care and social service referrals. And yes, we do also offer that supplemented, supplemental nutritional voucher as needed. Our programs do not just focus on women and children, but the community as a whole. We are looking to refocus many of our programs to place more emphasis on specific resident populations based on data, some of which, again, um, is provided to you in your packet, where we see where there is variation in care, access, and um, implementation. And so um, many of our programs started working uh, as I came on board in August, and will continue to work to uh, reshift and refocus to focus on those specific populations. Thank you. Good morning, uh, I'm Temple Robinson. I'm the CEO at Bond Community Health Center. Shankton told me three to five minutes and then he said, Dr. Robinson, tell the story of Bond. I'm not gonna tell the story of Bond. <laughs> and I'm glad we have the skirt here. So if he kicks me, I'll know, but you all won't know if I go too long. Um, I won't do that. <laughs> hey, that's my doctor, don't y'all kick her. <laughs> Bond is a federally qualified community health center, an FQHC. And uh, for those of you who do not know, FQHCs receive some federal funding. And as many of you have heard me say in the past, just enough federal funding to generate a whole lot of paperwork and reports. But the federal funds do support many of our activities, such as pharmacy, such as uh, malpractice coverage. Uh, such as access to discount medications. And, and we're also able, uh, able to leverage that um, distinction to do other uh, things. Uh, but Bond is supported by many stakeholders and, and especially the taxpayers of Leon County. And we're very thankful for that. Um, and we have many collaborators, of course, the CareNet Group, a lot of uh, other healthcare agencies in town as well as human services, um, such as a Second Harvest, who work closely with them and Head Start and so forth. Um, our sites are, um, we have three brick and mortar sites. The main site is at uh, 1720 South Gadsden Street. And as I say, if you don't know where we are, then shame on me because that means I haven't gotten with you to invite you and so you can come over and visit with us. We also have a site on the corner of Palmer and Monroe, which is undergoing some renovation. We have a site in the CareNet building called Bond on Magnolia. Care, I'm sorry, in the CarePoint building called Bond on Magnolia. And if you know, CarePoint is on the corner of Magnolia and uh, Monroe. And then we have a very robust mobile unit. We provide primary care and dental care to the Kearney Center, to this village, to the Cesha House, to Good Samaritan, to Sable Palm Elementary School, and uh, many others. Who do we see at Bond? Well, Bond takes all comers. Yes, we see uninsured people. That's our stock and trade and underserved folk. But we take care of anybody who needs health care. We take almost every insurance uh, here in town. Uh, we are CHP providers. We're Blue Cross providers and so forth. You have a very um, thick agenda item with some um, statistics and data about Leon County. And I always tell folk, uh, you can have data and in the government, you know, you can have data and then you can have facts. Um, in Leon County, uh, overall, only eight, about 8% 8 of Leon County is listed as being uninsured. But for the patients that walk through the doors of Bond, 31% of our patients are uninsured. 84% of them live below 200% of the federal poverty line. 70% live below 100%. All right? 31% are uninsured, and almost 90% live below the federal poverty line. Bond serves many of the working uninsured. So these are people that have been recently laid off, probably can't afford COBRA, have never been uninsured in their life. They're between jobs. And we provide a lot of dental care for people who may have medical insurance, but don't have dental insurance. And if you don't have dental insurance, you can imagine um, what that is like. You have data about early entry into prenatal care in Leon County. 
And you'll see that in your agenda item. And in Leon County, it's about 77% of all women get to some prenatal care during their first trimester. For the population that we serve at Bond, unfortunately, only about 50% of the women we see enter prenatal care in that first trimester. Similarly, in Leon County, the low birth weight rate, if you say that very fast, you'll get tongue-tied, the low birth <laughs> weight rate is about 10%. A wide disparity between Blacks and whites, we've talked about that in the past, and at Vaughn, unfortunately, our low birth weight is about, rate is about 14%. Now, who are we not at Vaughn? We're not the health department. We're not a free clinic, though some services may be free depending on your eligibility if you're a patient. We're not a freestanding lab. Don't just knock on our door and say, I want a so-and-so drawn or, or so forth. And during normal times, whatever normal times are, services are rendered at bond to registered or enrolled patients only. Um, the COVID-19 public health emergency permitted FQHCs to provide testing and vaccinations to anyone seeking those services because of supplemental federal funding. And for many of you and many residents in Leon County, that was your first exposure, no pun intended, to the comprehensive services that are provided at a community health center. And you realize how comprehensive and inclusive the services are. So some of those services at Bond include primary care, adult, family medicine, pediatric, prenatal, uh, prenatal care, behavioral health, dental, and dental is all going to be in almost every site we have, Ryan White and HIV AIDS services, podiatry in-house, chiropractor, full pharmacy, some limited radiology. We have cooking schools. We have diabetes education classes, medication management, don't kick me, um, <laughs> transportation. And then we do a lot of teaching with the, the, the three schools that are here, medical uh, uh, students and uh, residents, nurses and nurse practitioners. We still make house calls at Bond. We do deliver medication. We mail medication. We have home monitoring when people have their uh, blood pressure machines or diabetes machines. They can do this at home. It drops into the electronic health record so the doctors can make changes in real time. Some of our upcoming projects in Leon County, you will be um, very involved in this. Uh, the dental clinic is under construction at Sable Palm Elementary School to provide dental services to those children and the people in that adjacent community. Um, we're in the permitting process, and if anybody has any pull with the permitters, I really would appreciate it. We're in the permitting process to do some renovations at the building on the corner of Palmer and South Monroe to consolidate OBPs and some dental services under one roof. That's also with the pediatric cooking school. And we'll open a new pharmacy at that site, um, and you will... You all will remember many of the pharmacies on the south side closed over the past five years, so access to pharmacy is limited. Um, and we have several big infrastructure projects going on at the main site where my office is. In, my office is. Our challenges, just like everyone else, workforce, workforce, talented, smart, teachable, workforce, people who want to come to work and work when they get there. Um, our bench is not very deep. I watched the playoffs last night and the 49ers, 49ers won with, I don't want to call them the third string, but I want to say they, their, their bench was very deep. And that's what we need. COVID is still around. We have a lot of our talented staff they're out with COVID or they're out with COVID and flu at the same time. And our visit numbers have, mine have not rebounded to the pre-COVID uh, era. The cost of care. And I'm going to stop. And first, I want to thank the taxpayers of Leon County. And I want to thank the Leon County commissioners. Um, you all provide um, $125 per visit uh, for dental and medical and $80 per visit for our behavioral health. Our average cost of care for medical and dental run about 
All right. So I am thanking you now for considering including more of the visit elements for in your upcoming funding. Um, because we have to do labs and x-rays and case management and so forth. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I'm sure my counterparts are going to talk some about this. Other challenges providing access. <coughs> Pardon? Right. 125 for <clears throat> medical and dental, 80 for behavioral health. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, other challenges include pro uh, providing access to specialty care and, and screening services for uninsured patients. The We Care Network does a great job of providing access for patients who have life or limb threatening ailments. Thank you, Bernie. Um, but we don't have access to a lot of screening services. So if you're uninsured, more than likely, you've never, you've never had a screening colonoscopy, even though you may be in the age of someone who needs a screening colonoscopy. So these are the type, these are some of the challenges, and we can't fix them all today. And I, I won't go into a, a lot of all of this because I don't want to cross over what Ms. Freeman is going to, to speak about. But um, then we have people that fall, like all of us, between some weird gap. They make a little more, so they're over 100% of federal poverty. But um, because of that, then they don't qualify for the Leon County funding services, and they're uninsured. So some of our dreams are bond. We talk about uh, we're dreaming of help providing help. I'm sorry, um, child care for our employees. Um, we talk about women and children. That's we know if mama's not healthy, nobody's healthy. But we've got to expand our support and services for men. You guys are in bad shape. You really are. And so we've got to look at what support services can we get for men. Don't tell health, me, doctor. Don't tell yeah, me. Yeah, for health care. <laughs> uh, and it needs to be presented yeah. in a way that it's palatable to you. I think that a lot of reasons why men are resistant to health care is just not presented in a way that it's palatable to them. So we're looking at support for men from a behavioral health standpoint and from a a medical standpoint. Um, and then I just want to thank you because you. Leon County funding has been a great benefit. We, you know, we whine and complain, but we couldn't do what we do without it. And access to primary care is the rate limiting step to a healthy pregnancy, a healthy baby. You need to be in your top, tip top shape uh, in in a preconceptual status before you even think about getting pregnant. That's the best thing you can do. So if we can help um, make sure that uh, our residents are healthy prior to getting pregnant, the mom and the dad are healthy, we can push the needle, uh, move the needle on the health outcomes. Um, the Leon County funding uh, permits us to leverage state and federal funds and bring them to the area. So sometimes we come to you and ask, can we use, pinch off a piece of this to match with that so we can get some state and federal funds? We appreciate that. And then it also frees up other dollars to cover those uninsured and unfunded things that we do at bond, such as transportation and offering a cook in school or case management or medication management. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to invite you. Come visit with us at any time. Thank you again. And thank you for the consideration of giving some flexibility and how we can spend um, the taxpayers' funds and how we can better serve um, Leon County. Thank you. And he did not kick her. <clears throat> you notice he didn't kick her. Did not. <laughs> Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Janae Freeman. I am the CEO of Neighborhood Medical Center. We are also a federally qualified health center. I, I do want to take a moment and just say um, thank you from the entire team at Neighborhood, from our board, from our staff, the consistent support of the this commission and the concerns for health care for the residents of Leon County has been tremendous. It is definitely a priceless partnership, and we do appreciate it. Um, Neighborhood Medical Center, as I stated, is an FQHC. We operate six locations between Tallahassee and Gadsden County. We provide primary care, pediatrics, 
HIV services, dental, mental health, and case management. <clears throat> we also provide OBGYN services as a part of the primary health care model. We operate two school-based health centers, and in 2022, we became an accredited health center through NCQA, which is which now we have the designation of a patient-centered medical home. So this means that the model of care that we provide, it puts patients at the forefront of care. So we focus on building better relationships between our patients and the clinical teams that we have on staff. So last year, our sites provided over 21,000 visits to patients and 78% um, of our patients reported incomes that were at or below 200% of the poverty level. And 70% of those patients had either no insurance or were enrolled in Medicaid. So the, the whole thing here is Dr. Robinson and I hope that our insured patients can help take care of our uninsured patients, but that's never enough. It, it really isn't enough. Um, <clears throat> so, with the pandemic, we had to really um, change the way we did operations. We had to put a lot of our normal face-to-face -face services through telehealth. So last year we had over 5,000 telehealth visits, which accounted for one of every three visits. And in 2022, half of our patients received behavioral health services, which accounted for about a third of all of our visits. So that need is definitely there and, and pressing. I wanted to kind of give you some impact on some, some of the economic impacts that FQHCs have. Dr. Robinson has his information as well, specific to her health center. But at Neighborhood in 2022, our economic impact was 11.3 million. There was a return of investment of 191% for each dollar invested into our community health center. So in 2022, we accounted for 123 jobs throughout our service area that providing jobs for both at our health center and throughout the communities that we're located in. 88 of those jobs were directly, there were direct positions at neighborhood and 35 of those were indirect or induced jobs sustained because of the activity generated by our team. Um, getting in some, into some of the challenges that we face with taking care of the uninsured and underinsured, specifically as it relates to the care net program. So there are requirements that our patients have to um, bring forth when they come and try to become eligible for this program. There's a proof of residency. So we have it oftentimes we have patients who live with other people. Some of those family and friends are reluctant to write a letter to verify their residency. That becomes a barrier to care. Proof of income. When people get paid via cash or as some of us know under the table, there are no check stubs. There's no way for people to provide that proof of income. And then also proof of identity. Most of our patients can't afford to go gather and go get the documents needed to get an ID or to get a driver's license. Those aren't things that are on the priority list. And these are the things that we face that are also known as barriers mm -hmm. to healthcare. Some of the clinical challenges that we face with this specific patient population are the multiple comorbidities within our patient population rising costs of lab fees associated with primary care visits. So that 125 covers that visit that we get, and we do appreciate it, as Dr. Robinson said. But there are so many other things that spiral out of primary health care. Patients need labs. Patients need medications. All of these things have increased over the years. And then there, this patient population is um, sometimes difficult to follow through with the preventative care and treatment plans. So we work to try to keep people out of the emergency rooms, but it becomes difficult when the patients that we're taking care of are facing so many other problems that they feel like take priority over their health care. There also um, are a lack of access to certain specialty, specialty services that aren't provided by we care. Um, we're having some trouble with podiatry, endocrinology, rheumatology, neurology, and also maternal fetal medicine in addition to diabetic eye exams. Patients, um, some, we're, we're, we have a lot of patients now that um, are of migrant populations here in our county, and they're in need of specialty services um, for their children. So orthopedics and audiology are services that they cannot afford. Those are specialty services that when they get the referral, they can't afford to pay the fee up front. The other um, healthcare issue um, with maternal health, there are several challenges that we face. Most of our patients are late to care, like Dr. Robinson said. Most of our patients enter care in the second trimester. So that's 26 to 27 weeks 
that they have not had any care with the baby in the womb. They're not able to pay for ultrasounds, which can pick up on certain things that on mom and the baby in utero. And most of the patients that we see are high risk moms. They're high risk OB moms with health, health conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, a BMI over 40, and anemia. So usually what happens to someone who has health insurance when they are a high risk mom, they get referred to maternal fetal medicine. That's not an option for the patients that we have because they're uninsured and they can't pay for the services out of pocket. So that increases the number of times that these moms, when issues arise, have to go to the emergency room because there are things that we can't do in the primary care setting. So just to highlight a few of the things that we've been able to do with our maternal health program, um, we've been delivering babies for probably about five years now consistently. And in 90% of all of our patients are referred to Healthy Start. Mm -hmm. So we do appreciate that partnership as well. In 2021, we had 71 births. 21 were Hispanic, 41 black, nine white, and one more than one race. We did have three stillbirths. We had three babies who were born with low birth weight, rates, weights, excuse me. You got me, Dr. Robinson. <laughs> and 2022, we did see some improvement. We had 74 births, 32 Hispanic, 34 black, eight white, no stillbirths and no low birth weights. So that was definitely an improvement. Um, the impact of this funding, like I said, is priceless. You all have supported us for many years. If it were not for this program, more, more, we would have, we would have lost more people than we, than we have. Um, this program helps reduce neg negative health outcomes. And from the start of the pandemic and before, this board has supported our immediate and anticipated needs related to COVID, especially in the communities of lower socioeconomic status and communities of color. This program has also responded to the immediate need of COVID testing in the community through the use of the testing sites. Um, like Dr. Robinson said, many people in this community did not know who we were until it was time for us to come out on the front lines and do testing and also provide vaccinations. But we've been here and we're not going anywhere. And a lot of the people that you know, we take care of. So it is very important that you help us spread the word about what we do. Um, the board has, has always dedicated um, their support to neighborhood and bond in so many ways. And this is a major reason as to why we're able to renovate our new location on the South, on South Monroe Street. So hopefully in the next two to three weeks, we'll have a soft grand opening so that you all can see what you all have invested in neighborhood and what we're willing to continue to invest in our community with the opening of our new location on South Monroe Street. So um, this is truly the definition of collaborative partnerships within local government. And what's next for us? Again, that location is opening next month. In that location, we will operate an on-site pharmacy and we will have a dental lab to um, produce dentures. We have a new location that's opening in Gadsden for maternal and pediatric health care. And we would like to expand our um, OB and pediatric program in Leon and Gadsden as well. So thank you. Thank you. Good to see you this morning, Jay. Oh, good to see you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. And uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative of being able to go after Dr. Robinson and Ms. Freeman, who actually gave, gave a great account of a bunch of the stuff that uh, I, I never said as eloquently. So I'm, uh, I'm Jay Reeve. I'm the CEO of Appalachia Center. And Appalachia Center is uh, not a federally qualified health center. We are a... <laughs> We are a uh, independent 501c3 organization, and what we do is behavioral health. Now, in addition to that, we do operate three primary care clinics, but that's really for folks who are receiving behavioral health care within the Appalachian system of care. Um, we are the largest behavioral health provider between Pensacola and Gainesville. We have about 520 staff currently spread across our 11 outpatient clinics, eight residential programs, four acute service units, our three primary care clinics, and our seven specialty teams in uh, the eight counties of the Big Bend region. So we really cover the, the waterfront in Big Bend. Um, we do have uh, quite a few partnerships with folks 
here at this table, we provide the uh, psychiatric supervision for the mental health uh, services through Bond. Um, we utilize and had a great partnership with Florida a and University for, I think, the last 10 years, 11 years, that something like that. It, it's, it's been a while. Something like that, yeah. That, uh, wow, 14 years of that. Uh, Florida A&M has been providing our pharmacy services in our inpatient units. And uh, we also, uh, Dr. Robinson, Ms. Freeman, and I all sit on the Mental Health Council of the Big Bend together. So we, we've, we're we pretty interlinked with the local community as well, serving the other communities of the Big Bend region. In Leon County, in the last fiscal year, we saw 3,419 unduplicated Leon County residents. We've seen about, we, we see about 8,000 clients total uh, throughout our eight counties each year. Uh, of those, 1,728 were seen through our central receiving facility, which receives funding from Leon County. And uh, the, our crisis stabilization unit and our detox units. And so that represents about 61% of the total clients seen on those units. Um, it's, I think, important to note that uh, 1,145 Leon County residents were seen by one of our mobile crisis teams, either our mobile response team, our team's mobile unit, which we do in conjunction with the city, and our calm unit, which we do in conjunction with Leon County Sheriff's Office. Um, so the majority of our folks were not seen through our inpatient units. Um, and another 2,752 were seen through one of our outpatient programs, um, through our uh, joint clinic with FSE, through our clinic at uh, Care Point, through our Bethel Clinic, or through our main Leon County Clinic. Um, so let's see here. Uh, what else can I talk about that these folks haven't talked about already? Um, in 2021, we were accredited as a behavioral health home by the Joint Commission. We're one of only two centers in the state of Florida to receive that accreditation. And that's a recognition of our capacity to provide wraparound services for folks in our care for both the physical and mental health. Um, we currently, in addition to our other partnerships, we manage the behavioral health services and the behavioral health center at Tallahassee Memorial Health Hospital. So we're in, in close partnership with uh, our friends at TMH as well. Uh, in terms of our client population, it generally mirrors, in terms of demographics, it generally mirrors the demographics of the communities we serve in Leon County. There's a, a higher preponderance of folks from um, lower SES and more challenged neighborhoods, which tend to reflect the higher incidence of mental health diagnoses in those neighborhoods. Um, but by and large, in terms of numbers, it's kind of proportional to the counties we serve. Um, the, this, we will serve like neighborhood and like bond. Um, we serve anyone who needs service. So those are folks with no insurance. Those are folks with Medicaid. Those are folks with Medicare. Those are folks with any form of commercial insurance. And we accept every commercial insurance, Medicaid, HMO, and uh, other form of Medicare payment that are, you know, operative in this region. Um, in terms of our, but however, um, our sort of special mission is in addition to serving anybody who shows up with really any behavioral health care issue, we're one of the, actually in some counties, the only provider for folks who are living with serious mental illnesses. So folks who are living with schizophrenia, folks who are living with severe bipolar disorder, typically will have had some contact with that biology center the years, and that's our special mission. Um, I'm a psychologist by training. I've been in the field for 37 years, and so this is kind of what I've been doing my whole life, well, my whole working life anyway. Um, in terms of particular challenges for us, I think this really echoes what Dr. Robinson and Ms. Freeman have said. We have uh, 
had an explosion in the cost of care in the last two years, and that can be traced to exactly one thing, and that's the workforce shortage. Just to give you a flavor of that, last year, our budget for traveling nurses and uh, agency-related staff exceeded our, our spend on that, exceeded our budget for that area by four times. We quadrupled it. Um, that was in addition to giving out a substantial number of raises that we had to to keep our workforce engaged since the, the price of care has gone up so high. So what that means in terms of Leon County, and I'll you know sort of circle back to something Dr. Robinson was saying a minute ago, is that um, for the both the CARENET funding and the um, Baker Act, Marchman Act funding, which statutorily the county provides, our unit of service, our cost of a unit of service has gone up pretty substantially, which means that the county's investment in that has proportionally decreased over the course of the past couple of years from about 25% to about 17%. So we will be revisiting that with uh, our our partners at the at the county and we have great confidence that we'll be able to come to a place that's workable for us to continue to provide the services we currently provide um because we have had such great support from leon county over the years i just um just sort of in closing on that though i think it's it's very important for commissioners to be aware that not every county in the state of Florida gives the kind of support, not just financially, but in terms of public messaging, in terms of engagement, in terms of support for new initiatives to mental health that Leon County does. We are a standout in that regard. And when I talk with my colleagues from across the state, there are issues and problems with ownership of different kinds of healthcare turf, with um, conflicts between agencies, with conflicts between local government and agencies that are fairly standard that we just don't have here. And the reason for that, I believe, is the extraordinary support that we as a healthcare community get from you all, from the leadership of this community, and that we extend to each other. We've we've created sort of a different way of doing business here. So I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pam Irwin. I'm the executive director of Capital Medical Society and Capital Medical Society Foundation. The We Care Network program is the premier program of the Capital Medical Society Foundation. As um, the executive director of CAP, provide volunteer donated specialty health care to low-income, uninsured residents, adult residents in this community. Uh, as Dr. Robinson and Ms. Freeman shared, you all compensate them for services that they are providing. In our case, you all are providing funding, which we deeply appreciate for our case management team that coordinates that donated care. We relieve the burden of these physician offices and hospitals from coordinating donated specialty health care. So last year, uh, you all helped us recognize our 30th anniversary uh, for our program. And during that time frame, we've coordinated over $125 million in specialty health care and provided $600,000 in patient assistance. About 65% of the care that we coordinate is for Leon County historically. So if you looked at that number and you looked at 65%, that would be $81,250,000 in coordinated specialty health care over 30 years and $390,000 in uh, patient assistance, which um, Diana will help explain a little bit more about what that means later. Um, the We Care Network's primary uh, mission is to be a safety net for these low-income uninsured adults in our community. Without us, 
um, they would not have access to specialty care. And there's a big difference between primary care, what um, our FQHCs and there are primary referring providers do and what we do. They're over there rec finding, taking care of the basic primary care needs, and then they identify patients that need more than that. And this wasn't in my pre-written script, but I'm gonna go ahead and piggyback on what they have said about the importance of these labs and diagnostics and those being covered for uninsured patients because <clears throat> we require labs and some basic diagnostic x-rays to be able to accept a referral. So if they can't get those paid for or they're taking a shortfall on that, it makes it harder. It's a barrier for them to get those patients to us. Then additional tests are donated by our providers. So it, we are very cohesive in our, in our collaboration on taking care of these patients, but that is the need they have. Um, the individuals that we see are often um, patients that have um, income at or below 150% of the federal poverty level, and they have very complicated health issues, as Dr. Robinson alluded to, high blood pressure, heart disease, serious illnesses, women and men. So about it's about 50-50. Uh, Diana will share more about that. But um, in 2022, a single household annual income must be at or below $20,388 to qualify for our program. And for a family of four, the annual income must be at or below 41628 So we're waiting for the 2023 numbers to come out. So as I, as I said before, our goal is to improve health outcomes and the quality of life for adults who really have nowhere else to turn but our program for specialty health care, to evenly distribute donated care among the volunteer providers so you don't end up with you know two or three gastroenterologists doing all the work. We spread it amongst all of them. And to reduce the cost to the community for avoidable emergency room care. And we all know that's the most expensive place to get health care. And I'm going to turn this um, over to Diana Bixler, our program coordinator, to speak more about the specifics of the program. Thank you. Um, this really takes a village, as you can see, with this uh, stakeholder group, I think, as, as we coin it, healthcare stakeholders in the community. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm Diana Bixler. I'm the program coordinator for the We Care Network program. Um, coming on eight years in this program, kind of fell in here coming from a program called WIC that Brandy spoke about. Um, so, really, the people in these programs have a passion for, for human services and social services in this community. Um, and we're really grateful for the continued support of the Leon County Board of County Commissioners for funding us through the CareNet grant. That has allowed us to, as Pam mentioned, cover case management services, but it also provides some patient assistance, which is critical to um, our patients' treatment plans, which I'll, I'll get into. Um, but for the past 30 years, um, as we celebrated last year, we've, we've heavily relied on these partners. So Bond Neighborhood and Appalachie, um, primary care all refer to our clinic. So they all identify the patients that need more than they can offer and then send them to our program. So the majority of the time those patients are eligible. They're kind of pre-screened and determined this would be a good fit for this program. Um, so those are the uninsured adult patients at or below 150% of the federal poverty level. Um, so by working with these primary care providers, we're able to identify those patients that we may not be able to identify just with our specialty uh, healthcare network. And our case management team, which is doing all of the work on the in-between primary care and specialty care, um, consists of four case managers and one case management associate. So we're very small. Those five individuals, in addition to myself and Pam, um, putting together all of the coordination here. All of our case management team has a background in social work, which is really important to understand the, the well-rounded approach to healthcare and the needs that they may have outside of that, making sure that they have prescription medications, transportation to those appointments, understanding the access to healthcare in those communities. So while Leon County is the, ma the majority of what we serve, we also serve Jefferson, Gadsden, and Wakulla. And so understanding the lack of certain pro providers in those rural counties and, and needing to get those patients into Leon County is also critical to, to their treatment. So the care that's received through our program is donated to our patients, completely no cost to them um, through the Volunteer Healthcare Provider Program, which is part of the Florida Department of Health. <clears throat> we work with 340 specialists, so those are physicians and dentists. We work with TMH Hospital, 
HCA Florida Capital. Um, we have a lot of ancillary partners like Radiology Associates, KWB Pathology for Lab Services, and other durable medical equipment companies. Um, anesthesiology Associates, when our patients have procedures, um, they donate the anesthesia for those procedures. And we also work with local pharmacies. So we work with Costco Pharmacy in Tallahassee, and we work with CareRx Pharmacy. And so um, the partnership with CareRx has been great. The pharmacists actually came from Costco and opened that. It was a, a dream. It's another local business here, um, very centrally located to the hospitals and as well as our office. <clears throat> Um, so our specialists do represent almost every medical and dental specialty um, outside of the handful that Janae mentioned, which we've struggled with for years, podiatry, rheumatology, neurology, and endocrinology. And there are different reasons for, for those specialists not being in the program, and that's something that we and our boards and committees address on a multi-annual basis at all of our meetings. So, um, so just a few statistics. I know that you you have many of those already, but... Just to kind of put a number on the impact in the community, um, in, la in last fiscal year, 21-22, we received 2,777 referrals for 2,198 patients. So many of our patients will have multiple referrals, um, and a lot of that is due to needing diagnostics, trying to figure out what exactly is going on, how to get them the treatment that they need. And so 1,847 of those requests were for Leon County. So that's about 65%, which as Pam mentioned, it's historically around 65 um, to 67% um, patients. And so 45% of those were male and 55% of those were female. And so we really see that almost equitable need in the community um, when, we, when we look at those demographics. <clears throat> so some examples of services because specialty healthcare may may not be as familiar when you're not in it, um, are going to be some cancer treatment, prostate cancer, breast cancer, mastectomies, and then those uh, post-surgical garments and items that they need. Um, diagnostic radiology exams, those are going to be diagnostic colonoscopies, diagnostic mammograms, um, breast ultrasounds. Their orthopedic surgeries, such as hip replacements, we've had donated knee replacements. <clears throat> neurology consultations, um, heart monitors, echocardiogram, stress tests, really trying to figure out the cardiac issues that many of these patients have as comorbidities that they're seeing in primary care. Um, sleep studies, which often lead to the um, providing CPAP machines or auto -pap, BiPAP, whatever it is that the patient needs based on those sleep studies at TMH Sleep Center. Uh, wound care, hernia repair, and other ophthalmic procedures. So some of those ophthalmology procedures that we've seen recently will be cataract surgery, glaucoma surgery, and even a corneal transplant, which um, was very um, impressive to see. So we're able to provide this transportation to and from appointments. We're able to provide dentures, crowns, these machines um, for pulmonology services, and then other prescription medications through the patient assistance fund. So that's the other part of the funding that's provided um, through CareNet that is necessary to kind of complete this treatment plan for these patients. But this fund, the patient assistance fund, is really limited. So those are funds that we are actually paying for. We're paying for these prescription medications. Um, we're paying for the supplies for the CPAP machines, such as masks and tubing. And, um, and an increase in patient assistance would allow us to provide additional resources to complete our patient treatment plans. So currently, we have budgeted around $36,000 in patient assistance per year for the entire program. And so just to see how quickly that can be absorbed, some examples are if, if we do have a prostate cancer patient, the two injections to get that treatment started is $1,300. Um, and that is necessary. Otherwise, the, the treatment can't be completed. Um, knee braces to potentially uh, reduce the need for surgery are around $995. Um, compression garments for patients who are... Um, undergoing treatment at, at the lymph lymphedema clinic at TMH physical therapy are around 900 to $1,000 just for maybe lower extremities or upper extremities. And, and that's just one set per patient. <clears throat> and so that can go very quickly. And we're looking at dentures between 300 to $600 a set. Again, so very, very limited, but very necessary. There, there are no other resources for these patients. And so that's where we step in. Um, so we're the only access to specialty medical and specialty dental care for the population that we serve, which are the low-income uninsured adult patients, um, which are going to be 18 and older. 
um, that kind of fall through the cracks in the healthcare system. So without the expansion of Medicaid in Florida, and now with the um, removal of citizens who may have been eligible during the pandemic, we're going to see an increased number of uninsured patients. Um, and so we kind of anticipated the opposite during the pandemic. We kind of anticipated a greater need due to um, loss of employment and loss of <coughs> coverage, health coverage through um, that. But we did see a lot of relief and a lot of programs that actually caused <coughs> the opposite um, and, and helped a lot of the residents, which is now going away. And so we now anticipate the need for this program to um, to increase and hopefully be around for another 30 years. Um, and the last piece of data that I'll mention is um, we've heard from everybody we're trying to keep people out of the emergency rooms and that is a very expensive way to receive health care but it's also a way that is something that many people it's the only thing they know to do. Um, and so in Leon County alone there the data from the county health rankings is there's over 4,000 preventable hospital stays. So that's a big chunk of the population that if you can get to them in preventive care, if you can help them with specialty care and keep them out and keep that for true emergencies. I mean, we've all heard about the waits and the lines in the ERs and um, needing that for true true emergencies here um, is important. And that's where we come in. So thank you for your time and for your support of our program and all of our partners. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. No, we afternoon, almost afternoon. Good morning, commissioners. <laughs> I bring you greetings from Florida a &M University College of Pharmacy, Pharmaceutical Sciences and Institute of Public Health. I bring you greetings from President Larry Robinson and Dean Johnny Early in the College of Pharmacy. Uh, I'd like to first begin by thanking the commission as Florida a &M University College of Pharmacy has been a participant in the uh, program, the safety net program since 2002 uh, at its inception when uh, Bond Community Center was located on West Brevard Street, I'm sorry, West Orange Avenue uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, since that time, uh, the uh, county commission has been continuously a provider of all of our uh, needs to provide patient care. Uh, we accept our position as being leaders in providing patient-centered medication management and pharmacy education in the region. Uh, while our wheelhouse is in the education area of that providing pharmacy education, uh, we also would like to uh, be a community participant in extending our expertise. Uh, I'm Gervin Robertson. I am the Director of Pharmacy Services with Florida a &M University College of Pharmacy, Pharmaceutical Sciences and Institute of Public Health. Uh, I'll begin by just uh, providing some of our partners. We partner with uh, Neighborhood Medical Center. We've had a longstanding partnership with Neighborhood, Bond Community Health Center, Appalachia Center, TMH Transition Center, Capital Region, uh, I'm sorry, HCA Florida Capital Hospital, FSU College of Medicine uh, Clinic, Florida Department of Health. Uh, as we provide our pharmaceutical care, we also look to research uh, patient medication adherence, linkage to care, so that those patients can continue to have providers that will continue to offer those patients those prescriptions that are necessary for them to have their medications filled. Without a provider, those patients can't have their medications filled, and we can't service them without some connection or linkage to a provider. We look at researching the provider's behavior on how they prescribe certain medications and they take care of certain disease states uh, that will affect the outcomes and may reduce overall healthcare costs. One thing about being towards the end of the agenda is that most of the time you're kind of piggybacking and everybody's always, you're co-signing what everyone else has previously stated. But, <laughs> but we all realize that as many of the providers that can provide, their patients can see uh, their providers, and if that patient doesn't get their insulin filled in their diabetes program, that patient is diagnosed with HIV and they can't get their HIV mm -hmm. medication, or that uh, pediatric asthmatic can't get their inhalers filled, then they end up in the emergency room. They end up with a 24-hour observation in the hospital, and then now we're flooding our hospital with unnecessary emergencies. We like to be a partner in providing those medications to the patients that prevent those, we call them emergent, but unnecessarily emergent uh, uh, exposures to our emergency room department. Uh, while we also have 
garnered support from the county. We like to work with other organizations as well. By working with mm -hmm. uh, Neighborhood Medical Center, we are we partner with major pharmaceutical companies that uh, allow us to be a part of their uh, prescri drug prescription assistance program, patient assistance program, also known as PAP. Many times these patient assistance programs provide medications that would normally cost this uninsured or underinsured patient thousands of dollars per month sometimes, depending on what they are. If we look at some medications for just insulin, uh, I'll call out just a name just to throw it out here, but an injection of something called Trulicity, that might cost that patient if they had to pay retail six or $700 per month, that would be very cost prohibitive. But through partnerships with uh, our uh, FQHCs, those patients are allowed to receive medications that are very, uh, at pretty much for free. We offer those medications and we're just a conduit by working as a partner with uh, Bond. Uh, we have uh, lo our locations in the community that the uh, county helps to support, located on West Orange Avenue uh, in the one locations in our um, uh, Department of Health building there with, where Neighborhood Medical Center is housed. We see patients in that regard. We are also have a location at West Brevard Street. So as Commissioner Proctor talks about the uh, poor zip codes in the county, 32304, we uh, provide medication assistance to the majority of the patients who live in those, as Dr. Robinson and Mrs. Freeman spoke about, in those pharmacy and food deserts. Uh, as we talk about food being a medication, uh, those patients, they live in food deserts or what we also know as food swamps. Those food swamps, that means that at the corner store, they go and get high fructose corn sugar. Uh, they're getting uh, over consuming uh, things that will eventually lead to obesity, that will eventually lead to cardiovascular disease, or that will eventually lead to some other prolonged complication. So we like to be a partner in those communities that many times those patients, they don't have a pharmacy nearby, so they have, they have to walk, they have to get transportation from a friend or family member, uh, and we're right in the heart there. There's pretty much, I would venture to say there's one part, there were only pharmacy down by the fairgrounds, the CVS there is the closest one in that, in the, in the particular radius that patients could get to. You have, uh, Publix down on, uh, Woodville Highway or, uh, uh, South Adams down that way, but these patients otherwise would not be able to receive their medications without the continued support from the county commission. We also have a population of patients uh, uh, that we take care of uh, in, that are students in the you know, at the university, as well as uh, sometimes we will fill those students, and that's basically uh, provided by the university and the college. We staff the uh, student health services uh, pharmacy clinic there. There is a population of students as well as staff that we'd like to expand our services to. So there is growing opportunity to catch those uh, individuals that may be working, but that working poor, or that underinsured patient that may have Medicaid, they may have health care benefits, but they may not have the highest tier pharmacy benefits where their co-pays, they choose the cheapest plan, their co-pays end up being uh, almost um, makes it a, a, a barrier for them to receive appropriate care. So I'd like to thank all of the other partners for providing a detailed synopsis of what we do and what we partner with Appalachia, uh, Bond, uh, Neighborhood Medical Center, TMH, uh, HCA. We partner with all of these entities because we take all of the patients. Uh, we like to get referrals from TMH Transition Center, Neighborhood, get our prescriptions filled. Many times we fill our prescriptions at 95% below cost, right? So we make, we're, it's not for profit motive. Many times we uh, surround it within our education programs to educate our uh, new pharmacists, our new um, public health um, providers, epidemiologists. We provide that education so that we can then extend our services in the community. Uh, I'd like to thank you for over 20 years of partnership, and we look forward to having uh, more opportunities to grow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. How many more speakers? We got one more. Before she starts, commissioners, uh, Madam Attorney, to be in right order, as I understand it, because there is a staff recommendation where we need to take a motion first, then uh, do. Just no All right. Just want to make sure the commissioners understand after their. This last speaker speaks, I'm going to be looking for a motion and then we'll go into discussion. 
Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I'm Chris Sorchik, the Executive Director at Capital Area Healthy Start Coalition. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you this morning. Our coalition oversees several initiatives. Most people know us for our Healthy Start Home Visiting Program, working with pregnant women and infants birth to age three. We convene a fetal and infant mortality review project in which we abstract and review cases of local fetal and infant deaths and create recommendations for new initiatives and programs and policy changes for our community to better support these moms. People are often surprised to learn that Healthy Start is also responsible for the development of prenatal and infant health care service delivery plan and building a supportive community network to help us implement that service delivery plan to ensure the needs of the maternal and child community are being met. We currently have partnerships with several community organizations where we are working to address our key priority areas of access to care, racial disparities in health outcomes, maternal mental health, and substance-exposed newborns. Work done through our service delivery plan has led us to many new initiatives and programs for our area. In 2021, the Community Partnership Alliance was convened. New Alliance members can continue to be identified to help with help us create this supportive network to make sure that the community needs are being met. Also in 2021, we launched the Sister Friends Tallahassee Birthing Project to provide services to Black women and to address the racial disparities in birth outcomes. In 2022, we secured funding for our new home visiting program, Parents as Teachers, where we are working with our most at-risk clients. This month, we hired a fatherhood program coordinator because we understand the importance that father engagement plays in pregnancy and birth outcomes. In February, we are going to be offering free training to 15 community members for a new community doula program. We want to make sure that our pregnant women have access to doula services, regardless of the insurance they have or if they can afford the doula doulas themselves. This model is based on a model that is currently being run in the Indian River County Healthy Start Coalition. They've had it implemented for the past six years. They have seen uh, a reduction in preterm births. They have seen a decrease in C-sections, had fewer babies born at low birth weight and improved disparities in birth outcomes for women of color. While we're able to support these current 15 doulas, we anticipate a much greater need in the community and we'll be looking to secure additional funding to expand to meet the community needs. In the spring, we are expanding our Connect program and we are going to be placing a family specialist right in TMH to provide services and connect moms and families to resources prior to discharge with that newborn. <clears throat> Also in the spring, we are pulling together members of the healthcare, behavioral health, and social service organizations to address substance exposed newborns. State data has identified drug overdose as the leading cause of maternal death in Florida. Locally, we've seen an increase in substance exposed newborns. The community support for a new substance exposed newborn task force is high. The issues are complex and we will need to convene multidisciplinary groups to address the issues. The county has been a great partner for Healthy Start and we appreciate all of your support. We are thankful to have received partial funding for our Sister Friends Tallahassee Birthing Project. The libraries have hosted our traveling crib and have helped us share the importance of safe sleep. And through our partnership with the Leon County EMS, we have been able to provide free infant CPR classes to over 450 new parents and caregivers here locally. We look forward to strengthening our collaboration with the county through our participating in the FEMA Community Action Team, our Community Partnership Alliance, and possibly even our Substance Exposed Newborn Task Force. Thank you. Thank you. Shinkman? <clears throat> All right, with that, commissioners, um, what you have now on the screen are the recommendations for the strategic initiatives that I mentioned earlier um, for your consideration. If approved, commissioners, I'll just jump in there, yes. Shankin, if approved, commissioners, uh, later in the day, uh, these will be added to the list of pre-populated uh, strategic initiatives for your um, 
uh, adoption once again. Commissioner Pratt, did I vote the commission? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is certainly an area which to be. I'm sorry, Commissioner Pratt, you got a, you got a motion ready. Right? Um, Mr. Chairman, I do have a motion uh, that, in light of what is presented to us as option one and two, yeah. that we uh, adopt those with inclusion of a uh, $100, uh, our review of a $100 increase to the uh, $125 reimbursement and uh, the mental health reimbursement. And problematic here with this particular motion is that we've gone over a lot of information. We've invited a lot of health, uh, uh, we say, system delivery uh, entities, but we are purposing here today to uh, send out this money to cap Capital Area Healthy Start uh, and blah, 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 and it seems to leave out uh, others at this table. I don't want to leave out anybody, so I'm not comfortable with the recommendation unless I have misunderstood it. Uh, but I'm not going to support this motion, but I would make a motion that we, um, it's been what, about 12 years, Shington, since we've uh, looked at the reimbursement of uh, neighborhood uh, and, and bond, $125 dollars before you, patient. Before you, before you answer, I believe the motion on the floor, Commissioner Pratt, just to make sure I capture it is options one and two with us also looking at an increase uh, to the reimbursement for medical and mental health to to increase by 100, which make medical increase to 225 and mental health increase to 180. Is that correct, sir? Right. And I want to look at table three, where we have uh, merely $10,000 designated to mental health events. Before we go there, is there a second to that motion? I, um, Mr. Chair, I second it. Second for purpose by, of discussion. Yeah, second by Commissioner Cummins, Cummins for discussion. Commissioner Pratt, I do want to facilitate a little bit your comment about. Um, bond and neighborhood not being involved in option number one. Um, since we have a motion on the floor, what I would ask is that staff maybe speak to justification of maybe not including them in that piece there since they also... They they are included in that piece. Okay. Um, option number one specifically talks to the Leon County Healthcare Program, which includes primary care, dental care, mental I'm sorry, health I'm sorry, care. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Option number two. I'm sorry. Well, option one looks at laboratory x-ray. They don't pr provide x-ray and, and stuff like that. Yes. Speaks, speaks, speaks about it, please. They do. Yeah, they, they do. Um, and so the diagnostic and ancillary causes are specifically what we've talked to our partners. So when I mentioned we talk all the time, we talk all the time. And so this is this was developed in partnership with the folks you, hit, you see here around the table today um, to address those needs that we've um, We've brought to you, and they when they talk about the challenges that they have, Commissioner. Well, Mr. Chairman, what I'm saying is that this piece of paper says enhanced partnership with Capital Area Healthy Start Coalition. I see nobody else's name on the sheet of paper. That's, uh, it, that's I mean, does that, does that's just does, option number does two. That name, does that name include all these people? That's their collective name? Because no, so I can see their name on paper. I'm, option number two specifically talks about when we're looking at um, women and children health in the area of talking specifically about greater outreach and engagement in our community, which is what Capital Area Healthy Start does, what they're statutorily required to do um, and enhancing that partnership that we have with them. That's what option two does. But option number one captures um, all of the partners you see around here at the table. What and does the word enhance mean? I don't know what that means. What enhance? What does that word Shinti, mean? can I help you out? Yep. Um, Commissioners, if I could. Yes. What option one does is I think exactly what you're looking for. What it says is that, and the term of art here is the Leon County Healthcare Program, which is all of our partners at the table. And what we're suggesting here is that we bring you back a, um, uh, a, a cost during the budget process. We'll be coming back with a budget discussion item so you can make your decisions with all the numbers in front of you. And uh, for th those costs to better reflect their costs, so I think we're, I think what we've, we've got here is exactly what you're looking for. And so, an option one again, just for clarification, includes all of our partners, and we're recommending we bring you back those costs during the budget process to um, better reflect their costs of providing those services. All right, Mr. Chairman, I understand that better. I speak to to I think Commissioner Proctor's uh, question here is is around specifically option number two is speaking to. Uh, why, why we're just enhancing capital, capital area healthy start coalition, which I understand your justification there, but we also know that 
uh, bond as, as, and, and, as well as uh, neighborhood does the same thing. So his, I think his specific question is why are we not including those two in enhancements that we have in the partnerships when it comes to women and children's health care? Currently, we have a strategic initiative in place, commissioners, that specifically speaks to the participation and the partnership we have with Bond Neighborhood We Care Appalachia through the CareNet program. That exists. We do not have one right now for Capital Area Healthy Start. So, so is there any kind of way instead of instead of you know the language looks like we're just and, and it does not capture the fact that we're already working on those enhancements with the two partners that we already have. Um, it, so it's just adding them to the, the strategic initiative that we already have to include Capital Area Health, Healthy Start Coalition with uh, Bond and Neighborhood in their uh, enhancing their, their par our partnership with them to work. Absolutely. With Absolutely. So when we go into a little greater detail in the item about that option, we talk about the opportunity of connecting um, those women who are pregnant with Capital Area Healthy Start and everything that they do as part of this partnership when we're in we're, uh, as part of enhancement participating as part of their work groups that chris mentioned earlier i think that's going to be um, critical looking at ways we can continue to enhance and increase the amount of events that we have with capital area healthy start and the other partners here we have at the table through some of the things that we're doing at the library and with the things we do with ems and some of the programs that we fund like sister friends Commissioner Pratt, thank you for letting me kind of facilitate some you did a great conversation. Job. Great job. So it's, it's, it's back on you, then I go to the commission. Okay, thank you very, very, very much. I think that what we've heard today, these organizations have done an excellent job doing COVID. Um, I think uh, so much of our staff and across the county has done an excellent job doing COVID. Uh, I heard Dr. Robinson say that her staff uh, being on front line, uh, missing people. I heard uh, Dr. Freeman say that many of her people are out. Uh, I heard Jay Reeves say that many of his people are out, personnel, personnel. And I heard Jay Reeves say that in order to keep people, he had to increase salaries. Well, we're, we, we've been 12, 15 years down on 125. All of them need some more money. And what I'm saying to this commission is they need more money. And eggs have gone up. Uh, uh, lettuce is $5 a head. They need some more money for reimbursement. I want when we look at this thing enhancement uh, that we talking on the phone that ain't gonna get it i mean hell we're doing enough talking on the phone they need some more money and uh, i'm asking for the scale to come back to us with uh, closing the gap between what we're giving 125 and what uh rob says the actual cost of 256. i'm listening to money today and they need more money and any way that we can uh, begin to uh program that uh for our budget uh next year I want to see that close. They're working too hard. People are dying. Their, their own workers are dying. They're sacrificing themselves in ways that we're not on that front line. These folks need a little bit more money. Um, these are critical times and words matter. When I hear a governor talk about the mess that's going on around here, I look at every word, every single word and, and, and critical fault to what words mean matter in times like these when, um, when you have some sense of what is occurring. So who, 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 whose history don't count, uh, whose people don't count, whose patients don't count, I'm highly sensitive right about now. And I think that we have to be specific, not too broad, don't call somebody a name and leave everybody else's name out because there's this effort to leave people out. And we can't do that in Leon County. We have to include everybody in as long as I'm a commissioner. So I make this good motion uh, understanding uh, more fully that the administrator has fleshed it out uh, gives us broad understanding that this language is not exclusive, it is inclusive, and that's what I stand for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Project. I want to Commissioner Cummings, then Commissioner O'Keefe. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just very briefly, of course, I certainly wholeheartedly support uh, the recommendations option one and two, and I thank Commissioner uh, Proctor for fleshing it out, getting us some clarification and, and direction on, on uh, what's intended, uh, Shington, uh, by those two. Um, I, I'm just specifically concerned, as I said earlier, um, Mr. Chair, yes, about um, addressing some of the health care disparities. Uh, we have great partners in the community 
Uh, they are doing a tremendous job, and I appreciate the fact that I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Robinson at her shop. Um, they just address many of the needs that our uh, underinsured individuals have in the community. I met with uh, Ms. Janae Freeman at, um, at Neighborhood, and they certainly are doing a tremendous uh, job as well addressing um, our um, communities where individuals just don't have the resources to have good quality health care. I want us to continue and I want us to to continue our partnership. I certainly want us to look at increasing the rate commission of Proctor. But in doing so, I want us to to target some of the specific health disparities that are occurring um, in our marginalized communities. And this might be something that we address, I guess, when we come back and we look at specific uh, initiatives to move forward. Um, but I just want to say at this particular setting that I want to go beyond increasing the funding. I want us to, to have some specific uh, targets, commission or practice so that we can reduce the low birth rate uh, so that we can reduce um, infant mortality in our marginalized community so that we can reduce um, the um, mortality of our mothers in our marginalized communities. So having said that, hopefully we'll have an opportunity when we look at adopting additional initiatives as our bold goals and objectives that we can address that. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner O'Keefe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, agree with our commissioners that have spoken already, um, and I think it's it's time clearly to significantly increase the reimbursement rate to uh, to accommodate what it actually costs to do things. We can talk about what we care about, but what matters is where we put our money, and this is where that counts. Um, I do have a point of information either for the county administrator or for Shinkton. The option recommendations here um, and with the motion, are the amounts mentioned specifically what is being requested by staff or is the initial op initial recommendation to analyze and report back? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, yes. and Commissioner. This would uh, give us the direction from this body to continue to work with our providers so that we have all that accurately reflected when we bring it back to you during your budget discussion, uh, uh, during your budget workshop. Thank you, and then is it, um, I know it's hard to estimate and you can just say you don't know if you don't know, but is it possible that even a hundred dollars increase might not be enough? That's going to be part of the evaluation. Um, Commissioner, we've had preliminary conversations um, thus far, but I think we're going to, as um, I've heard in the past, gnaw on the bone a little bit more to see um, exactly what that number should be and evaluate that and bring that as part of the budget discussion item to the board in the summer. Commissioner Minor. I'm sorry, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask a question. We're just doing these two options, right? No, yes, sir. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and I think to your point, Commissioner O'Keefe, that obviously you got to operate within your budget. So staff will take all this information. They'll come back with recommendations, and whether it's $100 or $110 or $80, we'll chew on that and make a deliberate decision. I just wanted to thank all of you for being here today and presenting. I thought your presentations were extremely salient and very informative. Um, and I appreciate all that you do to maintain this very important sector in our community. Obviously, public health is is vital, okay, to the success and vibrancy of our community. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you, my LT36 classmate, Dr. Robinson, for your extremely articulate uh, uh, explanation of, of all the things that Bond does. And I know a lot of that overlaps with you guys. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Welch kind of stole my line about just, just thanking you for your time. But uh, um, I, I, I wholeheartedly support the, the, two, the motion on the table with the two options. I look forward to uh, having that come back and have us discuss uh, what we can do for the reimbursement rate. Um, I really wanted to thank all of you because the last couple of years with COVID, I mean, we all worked very, you all did incredible feats of miraculous mm -hmm. you know, work, just coordinating people um, with a very chaotic environment, not knowing much of what was coming at us. 
uh, and, and not everyone is here, right? The whole team that worked together is not all here, but, um, but a big part of it is. And I just want to thank you once again uh, for all the work that you did to, to save lives in this community. The work that you all did literally saved lives. And I, just, I, I know we know that. We've said it many times. I just want to say it one more time. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Comment, Commissioner Pratt, and then we'll go to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, wanted to ask the question, uh, the capital area. Um, the capital area only includes Walcala and, uh, and Leon County. How, is, is Gaston uh, and uh, Jefferson, Madison not part of the capital area? What, what excludes them from the capital area? And I saw the history of 1992 and la, la, la. Why are they not part of y'all's capital area? Coalitions um, in the state of Florida, and we are tasked with Leon and Wakulla County. There is a Gadsden County Healthy Start Coalition and a coalition of Jefferson, Madison, Taylor counties. So they are my sister coalitions, and we do work in partnership for some of our initiatives. They are part of our expanded femur program, and they are also working with us uh, to place the Connect Family Partner in the hospitals here. So Gaston is a standalone. That's correct, sir. Is that, um, I mean, even animals in the woods uh, travel in, in groups uh, uh, and Gaston has left the stand alone? Why is that? I mean, I don't understand. We would have to look into that. The, we are funded by, um, and our, our Healthy Start standards and guidelines are passed down from the State Department of Health. And wow. so that, I don't have, um, the ability to change the coalition boundary lines. Then finally, uh, my question on the y'all's area uh, about breastfeeding. Uh, certainly when I read about breastfeeding, Dr. Edward Hollifield come, comes to mind. Um, how, how do you measure uh, whether, and is there a methodology for measuring uh, whether uh, uh, breastfeeding has uh, expanded or has come in vogue? Uh, how do you measure increases of that uh, versus what do you go by? We go by breastfeeding initiation rates. Brandy, do you have anything further to say? You you all measure it at WIC. Right. It's based on our WIC data. And so as uh, women enter or visit our WIC program, that's part of the data points that we capture. And so that is how we're able to document uh, breastfeeding initiation rates. So it is still a limited number. Um, and then uh, the state does something with the methodology. I would have to get that for you, Commissioner, and give it in, and present it to you to be able to make like a blanket statement okay. that Leon County or whatever county has X initiation rate. Well, I appreciate these tables of numbers and nothing tells that story like these numbers. And uh, there is a critical race uh, uh, element applied to these numbers as they're depicted. And, um, we, this is startling still. There's, it's still increasing. And, um, y'all, y'all is all we got. So I appreciate, uh, each entity in your service capacity. Uh, we don't have anything but what y'all do. You are agents in this regard. So I too join our colleagues in thanking you, uh, what you render. And I think that, uh, Mr. Administrator, uh, Gaston County should not be out there. We got a med school in Tallahassee, pharmacy representative, all this stuff. I don't think we should leave Gaston County out there by itself. It's the only majority of black county, black infant mortality is raising more hell over there than any place else. Why is they alone? Uh, we need to tighten that up and to wear the name of capital uh, health agency and ain't nobody but wall color and us in it. It ain't the capital area. I like to see, um, some review requests that we include and we have lots of resources in this community. It, uh, are we our brothers and sisters keepers? Yes. And I want them included. I mean, what can we do? They should everybody, all these pairings of these counties and that county ain't got nobody else. Something is wrong with that. I'm not comfortable. And I hope that we could bring information back uh, in pairing uh, with, with Gaston County. I don't know why the problem, they got to stand alone. Thank you very much.
thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to talk today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, I understand completely that uh, when it comes to that, that's more of a legislative thing that we have to change and we're not, we're not task you to try to why, do it. Why but, did they isolate it? That's what I want to know. But I do, I do believe that, Mr. Administrator, we want to gnaw on that phone a little bit. I, I, I'm going to get to it uh, and sure. maybe have some kind of conversation around it. It sounds like there's a question to answer now. So while the capital area Healthy Start only includes Wakulla and Leon County, my WIC program covers Gatson County. So um, the capital area Healthy Start and their FEMA review are separated from the state level, but locally my staff covers Jefferson, Madison, Taylor, Wakulla, and Gatson County from a WIC perspective and other um, programs that we have that address women and children. So I just wanted to make that a point. So Gatson isn't fully left out of the picture, Commissioner Proctor, but as Chris stated, and as I reinstated that the Healthy Start, as it's mandated from state down, that's their decision. But from a local perspective, we do have programs that um, are regional from the health department that do include Gatson County where the women, infant, and children are taken into consideration. Well, I just well, I want to be most fitting. Maybe is if someone could get us back just a uh, justification on the methodology, methodology used by the state um, to 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 specify what area is covered by who, um, and, and that might give us a little more answer when it comes to why gas is, stands alone in cap, capital area. Help you start is just Leon and Wakulla, and then once we get the information back. If we want to dig a little more into it from there. We can do it from there. Uh, but I do, I do believe that uh, it's fair. It's fair to to make the point that uh, that this is a state thing. That the state decides, and not something we can do on our own. Nor can our representative from Cap Cap Capital Area Healthy Start uh, can make the justification and move on our own either. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just want the board to know I traveled the state with Governor Childs. I was special assistant to Governor Childs. I know about Healthy Start. I know how much energy he put in it. I, I walk across the state with him, travel. So I understand the spirit, his heart, leadership, all of that. Yes, I, I just was not aware that Healthy Start as a coalition, that these folk have not coalesced with anybody. That's, yes. that's my point. I, I've been there with the governor. I was there from the giddy up, know all about it. But that they are not coalesced with somebody, I need to know why. Yes, sir. All right. Motion on the floor is for options number one and two um, as amended to add that we look at a minimum increase of $100 to the uh, reimbursement for medical as well as mental health. But staff will look at uh, what if, if, if more than 100 is adequate is, is needed in order for us to adequately uh, move the ball forward with reimbursement. All those in favor of the motion to indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries without objection. So what we're going to do here, commissioners, is uh, we're done with this piece of it. We'll go back to the initiatives. Uh, I'm going to give everybody a, a chance to grab some lunch because it's 1230. Let's get back here and sit down to get started. Back with those initiatives, let's say, in 10 minutes. 1240, 1245, let's get back here. We'll get those initiatives started back up. Gotcha. I'm working lunch there. Right. You say in 10 minutes? 10 minutes.
All right, <clears throat> we'll call us back to order. We'll go back to the street and this initiative pitch. All right, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, again, our, our chairman suggested that we just keep things rolling uh, through lunch. We're very happy to do that. Um, like I said to you, uh, we've identified just a couple of strategic initiatives in each of the priority areas. And our staff presentations for each of these, we've got them time to only about five minutes each. We just want to give you guys a little flavor. Still want to encourage, uh, again, all the, any conversation that you might have because this is your agenda. Obviously, we could we'll stay here as, as, as long as you like or as needed. But just want to let you know that, um, that we've got them timed down to be pretty quick uh, hitters. Uh, but again, this is a good use of maybe your time here during lunch. So with that, let me just start it off by saying that uh, um, in the area of the environment, as we've touched on previously, we have 10 strategic initiatives currently in the first year um, uh, that are being effectuated by many of our teams throughout the organization. Uh, but now you'll be hearing from uh, two of the busiest people in, uh, in, in Leon County government for sure, our Public Works Director, Brent Pell, and our Director of uh, the Office of Restore Stewardship, uh, Maggie Terrio, uh, as they focus on just a couple of these initiatives and the progress uh, we've achieved over the past year. So I think Brent's going to kick us off. So Brent, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vince. Good afternoon, Commissioners. <clears throat> Today, I want to talk to you about strategic initiative number 11. We continue to work with the state to seek matching grants to emergency septic and sewer systems. Before I do, let me provide a quick overview of the Public Works Department and how our programs and work areas advance multiple strategic initiatives. We support the economy by maintaining over 600 miles of roadways. With this effort, we provide safe, efficient, and sustainable roadways, which enhance economic vitality. We support the environment by maintaining over 200 stormwater ponds and 60 miles of gunfire. We manage 29 CIP projects costing $63 million. DCIPs include projects that align our resources that support strategic initiative number 11. This initiative has received an unprecedented amount of funding made possible by leveraging state grants. These projects just don't put sewer lines in the ground. These projects also abandon the existing septic systems and provide connections to this new sewer system at no cost to the property owner. That's a ten dollars to $20,000 savings per homeowner. To further advance this initiative, the county and state entered a first of its kind multi-year funding agreement. <laughs> This funding agreement was a result of Leon County's strong commitment to reducing nitrogen levels in the primary springs protection zone and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection's willingness to provide a dollar for dollar match towards projects in Leon County. This plan commits over $30 million for water quality springs protection infrastructure projects. <clears throat> the county will continue to work to secure additional funding in future FDP budget years for the Northeast Lake Munson and Woodville Septic Sewer conversion projects. Strategic initiative number 11 further advances bowl goal number two, upgrade or eliminate 500 septic tanks in the primary springs protection zone. <clears throat> to date, the county has 195 septic upgrades and or conversions completed or in progress. This is 39% of the county's five-year target. These initiatives matter. We align our resources to make them successful and we'll continue to seek funding opportunities to further advance these initiatives and bowl goals. With that, I'd like to introduce Maggie Terrio. Thanks, Brent. Brent, if anybody uh, gets a little drowsy, I'll blame it on lunch and not my presentation. Um, good afternoon, really glad to be here. Um, and I get to speak to you about strategic initiative number 15. Um, of all the strategic initi initiatives, this one's particularly close to my heart as it was, believe it or not, 15 years ago, I had the honor of helping to launch the county sustainability program at the time. It was a fledgling uh, pilot program and because of um, your year after year of support um, in this um, uh, program, it has become well integrated into our entire organization um, and having a strategic initiative such as uh, the Sustainability Action Plan uh, codifies your commitment uh, to that in the years to come. As I well. thought I thought Maggie was going to say of all your strategic initiatives, this is by far the most important one. If you're Thank asking you. me. <laughs> Sure. So um, thank you for that continued support um, as well. I can't help but um, acknowledge, too, that the three pillars of sustainability are actually so well represented in your strategic plan with the areas of economy, environment, and quality of life. So um, very, uh, the, the two work very hand in hand. 
For quick context, um, the Office of Sustainability um, in 08 created a action plan. Um, that was kind of the first uh, iteration of what later became the uh, Integrated Sustainability Action Plan, or ISAP. Uh, that, of course, is now complete, and we're on second generation um, known as the ISAP. The ISAP has 18 goals and 91 action items. We've made uh, great progress, uh, as you have with the overall strategic uh, plan that you have, and 84% of the goals and 74% of the ISAP action items have been complete um, to date. Of course, this will be and has been a multi-year uh, effort, but also a multi-division, multi-work area effort. Um, that's not, although it was born in just one um, area of sustainability, as I'll share with you, you'll see that it's um, fully um, immersed throughout our organization. Um, it, my highlights will be brief, but for a very detailed update, actually in your agenda tomorrow evening is the annual status report of the ISAP uh, that goes into all uh, the minutia um, for that, that we're very proud of, of the work that we do. So known as the Office of Resource Stewardship, or ORS, my department, uh, we have four divisions. That's facilities, parks and rec, solid waste, and sustainability. Um, I'll give you a few highlights of how these four divisions are working to achieve this singular initiative. Um, for facilities, as uh, the ISAP has a goal to reduce our carbon emissions by our greenhouse gas by 30%, facilities management with your leadership has invested $17 million to upgrade and enhance our county building infrastructure. In the last year, that project is now complete. That uh, will be a unique contract where this energy savings that have come from that investment will guarantee payback in around 10 years. So we will get our full money back as well as be reducing our uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, when it comes to parks and recreation, we are very uh, proud to offer over 3,000 acres currently to our public um, through um, your leadership and direction, we will be opening over a thousand additional acres in the coming years. Most immediately, we're excited to be opening um, St. Mark's Greenway Phase 2, uh, expanding on ARP as, uh, as Carrie shared with you earlier. We will be adding amenities and enhancing that, um, and then uh, working to uh, construct the Northeast uh, Park in the coming years as just a few examples. When we move on to sustainability being one of the uh, divisions of ORS, Another uh, aspect of this uh, action plan is to double our solar uh, generation. We're well on the way to achieving that with our most recent installation actually at Fleet Management out of Public Works uh, with the 50 kW uh, uh, excuse me, array, and we're adding uh, plenty more locations in the coming years. Moving on to solid waste, uh, if there's one area that I'm most excited about today is to share with you a um, very impactful new pilot program. Um, this is an example where, yes, uh, sustainability, we're investing uh, through facilities in that 17 million to reduce greenhouse gases in our buildings, but what else can we do? We've already got $17 million, so this new novel pilot project is another way to help reduce our greenhouse gases, and we're doing this uh, involving the yard debris that is collected from the curbside and our area businesses throughout our community. Um, historically, when yard debris is collected, we chip it and ship it to a regional facility for boiler fuel, uh, which is better than many communities in the state that unfortunately landfill the yard debris. So we're far ahead of most, but for us, that's not enough. Um, through a pilot with a private partner, uh, we are going to, or we are beginning to process our yard debris into a charcoal-like substance called biochar. And instead of spending 20 minutes trying to explain what biochar is, I felt it might be most helpful if I just gave you a quick sample. These are, this is not coffee grounds. Don't open it, whatever you need. <laughs> but essentially, if I were to boil it down of what are you holding, uh, it's a charcoal-like substance uh, where we are baking the community's yard debris in an oxygen-free uh, area. Why this is so significant is because this is actually a carbon negative process. Um, at best, you often hear about carbon neutral processes. This is carbon negative. Uh, so another example of how we're reading, oh, Commissioner Welch smelled it. No, or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But part of why I'm so excited uh, is that this is not only the first biochar facility in the state, this is the first in the nation to utilize yard debris as that fuel source. 
um, to create biochar. Um, so I can tell you, it's not only my excitement, we other, <laughs> have other counties throughout the state that are watching this pilot program very closely, very interested. Uh, we have universities that are wanting to lean in and partner on educational opportunities and research. And even federal, just last week, we had interest from NOAA uh, wanting to know how they can come in and partner. So this is uh, on the very early end of pilot program, but so promising uh, for our community and perhaps um, much more than that. So these are all highlights of what the Office of Resource Stewardship is doing to uh, move the ISAP forward. But I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this is an interdepartmental effort throughout the county. And I'll pick the topic of um, electric vehicles is just one way to exemplify that. Um, so fleet management has ordered uh, 11 F-150 Lightnings, those electric EV pickup trucks uh, that are on their way. We're installing EV charging stations. We're going to be hosting an EV test day for our employees to help remove some of the barriers or perceptions of electric vehicles. And all of this has really been focused on the internal Um of course, some of our efforts are external as well. And so with your leadership in May, this board passed the EV ordinance, uh, working hand in hand with DSEM. Uh, the ordinance will ensure that necessary infrastructure is uh, in place on the front end of construction for both commercial and multifamily. So I did my very best to compact, uh, you know, an item that has uh, over 90 action items. Those are just the very top uh, to exemplify that this is well beyond just the Office of Sustainability and goes throughout. Uh, Brent and I are happy to answer any questions. All right, I got Mr. Welch, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chief. No, can you hear me? Hey, all right. Hey, thank you guys, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question, uh, well, both, you know, you guys do an awesome job and I probably deal with your offices or we do through events we need more than most people or more than most in, in my case. But, um, I had a question and Vince, you might be able to help with, but uh, I, you know, obviously the, um, primary springs protection zone, uh, septic to sewer programs are important, but we have some, some spots up in the Northeast in my district, specific, particularly Centerville Trace. Wasn't there some money from the CARES Act, I think, or something that, that, somewhere that sort of facilitated us getting much closer to to con making those conversions in the Springs Protection Zone, that which would then free up some money to go after some of those septic disorders. Can you give me an update on that? Sure. Brent, would you like to give it a shot? And I know that Alan can, can jump in as well, but what Commissioner Welch is saying is right. We've got a uh, uh, targeted areas uh, for um, septic and, and as we uh, Woodville uh, and, and the primary Springs Protection Zone is certainly uh, one of those. Um, Harbinwood, uh, uh, not Harbinwood, um, Northwest, uh, and uh, and uh, the Centerville Trace area is the other on the three target zone areas. So, Brent, yeah, if you could speak to a little bit about how we're getting closer to being able to uh, start to pursue that. And again, a lot of this is, is based on availability. Well, and it's based on where the state funds right, right. are targeted for which is the primary springs protection right. Right. but brent out from both yeah. either one jump say in. currently dep's funding bringing them all for primary spring protection so once this projects are complete absolutely we're going to start you know moving forward to other areas that, that definitely absolutely will benefit from this okay so may I follow I sure. yeah so i mean basically depending on the state's funding yes. of the primary springs protection zone. Yeah. still Yes. But the state's in a better position now, right, to really go after this primary springs protection zone, which should speed up some of the other areas. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. Thank, Thank you, you, Maggie. All right. <laughs> oh. Thank you. So 39% of what our target was 500. We've done 195. Um, what's the total need? While well, we've um, we've selected 500 as a number, but what is the total need for um, sewer uh, updates or conversions in the area? The total need would be every septic system that's out there. From our space protection, that's thousand. Okay. Some time ago, I heard the number nine thousand. I don't know if that's too too up close to Saturn, but uh, nine thousand. I wanted to know that given uh, the city's commitment to uh, sewer areas inside of uh, Capitol Circle, does that give us room to readjust and to target 
uh, areas which have not uh, heretofore been included in our circle? And uh, have we communicated uh, with the city in terms of, because it seems that uh, some of the areas that we had targeted, uh, those areas now the city is taking ownership or doing. And I think that uh, to the extent that uh, our target and their target, uh, how do we reconcile uh, what the city is going to be doing going forward? I definitely don't want to uh, for us to extend, expend money that the city is uh, fully capable of uh, affording. Commissioner, the areas the city is addressing were not part of our plan. Okay. The city's areas are sewer that was never intended to originally be sewer by our program. What we'll be doing is looking for opportunities to find grant funds for people to hook up in those areas. But that is separate and apart from what we've already committed going south on the Woodville area. Okay, very good. Will we, at some point when the city uh, comes up with a uh, more descriptive idea of what they are doing. Uh, I certainly, for one, would definitely appreciate um, knowing their timetable, uh, their approaches, and I'm, 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 I'm assuming that they're not working from a grant uh, posture, uh, whereas we have been. Uh, and I definitely think that our commission would appreciate knowing uh, that urban services have been uh, extended totally and throughout the urban services area. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> yes, I just want to <clears throat> I just want to say thank you. I know this project is extremely important to Woodville and the, our folks over at Lake Munson. And so I want to just say thank you for continuing to push us forward. Anything else? See nothing else? Next submission. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Moving right on, right along to quality of life. We currently have 15 strategic initiatives uh, that we're advancing under our strategic plan, uh, as you'll see on the screen. Uh, uh, and um, uh, we have two more uh, uh, superstar leaders in our organizations that are uh, uh, ready to present to you. Pamela Monroe is our Leon County Libraries Director. And of course, uh, Chad Abrams is our EMS uh, Chief. And um, uh, Pamela uh, is going to go first because um, she didn't want to follow someone who like saves lives for a living. None of us want to <laughs> follow Chad, so uh, so Pamela's uh, Pamela's up first. And with that, Pamela, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Pamela Monroe. I will be presenting on Strategic Initiative Twenty One: Implement the Essential Libraries Initiative. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is my second board retreat. I came last year, but this is my first year as library director. So I'm really excited about what we have done this year. Um, the Essential Libraries Initiative was approved by the board in 2021. Um, it is a community-based plan that was developed to re-envision and revive our library system to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our citizens. So I've got some numbers for you as well. Y'all love numbers. 1.3 million. That's how many items that we circulated last year. Items circulated, which is that's more than the population of Rhode Island. Population of Rhode Island being library, and you know I have, have those numbers. It is 1.096. Okay. Um, actually, we don't just, of course, circulate books. We brought in this year our library of things, so we are circulating cold salts, and chastity was okay with that. Um, we're circulating high hats, we're circulating all kinds of things, hot spots. So the library really looks at what is that, is, what is that our community is, and we're making sure that we're getting that out there too. We have 146,000 card holders, that is about half the population of Leon County which is about 10,000 a year is how we're growing that. We're hoping to um, bring more people to be Leon County card holders. It's free, so why not have one, right? Um, and last year, we had a record number of 1,700 programs. That is programs, yes, 1,700 programs related to our, that are, have been crafted around our central libraries initiatives focus areas. And that's really important to us because we 
the Essential Libraries Initiative was actually created based on what the citizens of Tallahassee and Leon County wanted to see. Um, I'm going to talk, though, about some of our unsung accomplishments that have made a huge impact in our community. Everybody knows about the Library of Things, right? Everyone knows about these great wander and wonder trails and what's happening inside and how we put trails at Fort Brady and Woodville. But we've got some other um, things within our initiative that have really made an impact. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of those is Storytime Reimagined. So we partnered with FSU, Florida Center for Reading Research. I always have to say it in my head. And we have created some... Um, they help us train our librarians to become a lot more sensitive to our audiences. For example, we have sensory story content. Our librarians also went through a six week training of how to make sure that your story time is meeting the needs of everyone. So they've done some story time best practices. Now, taking that group of librarians Putting them into story times throughout our county, because we, of course, have seven libraries. Those libraries are teaching parents how to make sure that early literacy skills are being taught. So, take it a little step further. Now, because of our partnership with SCRR, we have created these book loop bundles, which are kits that parents will be able to check out in March. That they can actually take home story. It has all types of tips where parents can help their children learn to read at a very young age. And they're in all ages. We also have, I know Commissioner Cummings has been talking a lot about health care, and that's important to us too. We have health literacy that we're teaching and we're talking about in the library. Um, mental health and wellness has been a huge, huge thing in this county that we're, we're finding that we need to make sure that we're getting resources out to everyone. So starting in March, get your yoga mats out. We will be having yoga and meditation workshops in our library system. And this is all free. We have senior lunch and learns. We're doing coffee and cards. We have mobile health unit visits that are coming out to a couple of our branches, Woodville and Fort Brayton. And next week, we're going to have a health literacy fair at Main Library downtown. We have touched base with the International Rescue Committee, and we're having a story time for refugee mothers of Afghanistan who are bringing their children to the library and they're both learning English. It's amazing, and we have a staff member who is assisting with that. And I am very, very, very proud to present. We have, and we are only a, one of, I think, five libraries in the state that has a community resources specialist, also known as a social worker. Mm -hmm. So when I say meeting the needs, we are. Our Social worker came on board in July last year and she already helped serve over 120 patrons, people that are coming in for assistance like filling out SNAP, government related things, um, social security, healthcare paperwork, employment resources. And um, I was looking over her report the other day. She has even helped some people actually find housing. So when I say meeting the needs, this is your library doing the work that you have given us to do. Um, we have partnerships with the Federal Corrections Institution. We're trying to develop a program where, we, where they can check out books. <laughs> we have a partnership with Second Harvest that I'm extremely happy about. We saw a need in the Great <laughs> Spot Kids Cafe. Children are going to be able to come to our libraries to get food during the summer. Um, and we also have a partnership with the FAMU TRIO program where we've got something called Career Online High School. So if you have someone who's 19 or over and they don't have a high school diploma, they can go to the library. All they need is a library card. We will hook them up with a tutor 
where they can get their high school diploma, not a GED, a high school diploma from a private institution. And that, of course, in turn, gets them some certifications and with the Family Trio program, possibly getting them into college. So these are just a few of our unsung things that we're doing that are making a huge impact in this community. And let me tell you, we've only started. We've only started. We've got some capital improvement projects. I've been talking with Keith Bowers about how we can partner with OED. So we're doing it in the library. And it really is all thanks to you and some people having some great ideas about how our library can make an impact in this community. So thank you very much. And I give you Chad Abram. Thanks, Kevin. That's a lot to follow up on, honestly. Um, well, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with uh, an overview of how EMS really intentionally aligns our efforts uh, with a strategic plan. So that's to talk to you this afternoon about the Strategic Initiative 22, which is continue to evaluate emergency medical response strategies to improve medical outcomes and survival rates. Now, before I get into the specifics of that initiative, I just want to take a moment to remind you of some of the work that EMS does. Um, this certainly isn't an exhaustive list. It's just a high-level overview of what we're doing. It, it's hard to believe that December of 2023 and this year will mark our 20th anniversary of the county providing EMS services in this community. To date, we've responded to over 700,000 700, calls for service. Last year, is over 50,000 calls for service, which is double the number of calls for service we responded to in our first full year of operation. So thanks to your leadership and support in providing these services, you know, there's thousands of our neighbors that that got to celebrate the holiday season just a few months ago uh, because of that work and the effort that uh, your leadership brought in with that. Um, and the county's done this with excellence. We've won over 30 national and state awards, including two times being named the National EMS Service of the Year. We've been continuously accredited for the past 13 years. Uh, the accrediting body sets the highest standard of ambulance service delivery in the country. We're the first city or county operated uh, service in Florida to be uh, accredited. There's now about 27 similar services. <clears throat> We're, we've been consistently recognized by the American Heart Association for the care that we provide to heart attack and stroke patients. And um, you heard from one of, from many of the partners that we deal with in the community, but one of the awards we received last year that we're very proud of was from the Capital Area Healthy Start for the work we've done to help impact infant mortality with them. We only receive this level of recognition in these awards if we focus our efforts uh, and our resources on achieving meaningful results as informed by the strategic plan. So um, st that strategic plan uh, initiative, again, uh, how we can continually improve medical outcomes is really an important part and, and really the basis of what we do. <laughs> Lots of communities have ambulance services, uh, but if you want to have a, a really good ambulance service, you have to continually go back and look at how you can improve outcomes and really work with partners on how to do that. We can't do this alone. So I'm just going to, we just picked out three things that I just want to highlight the, of how we do things that align with the strategic initiative and how that makes a difference in our community. So the very first one is our approach to cardiac arrest or when someone's heart stops, you know, very uh, major emergency that we deal with um, on a continuous basis. We know that early recognition of that event, early CPR and early defibrillation are one of the things that's probably just as much as your EMS system, your paramedics, your hospitals do. So we know that we're very intentional with our, our process of how we respond to those. We have to have the, this, the community involved. That's why we do so much CPR training. Uh, we, we train about a thousand citizens a year in CPR, including that press the chest event where we do hundreds of, of trainings at one time. Excuse me. Um, it's also why we advocate for, for organizations to have defibrillators in, in, in the community, AEDs. Um, there's over 1,300 AEDs in our community. Uh, we have a registry where organizations can provide us that information. That's put in the computer aided dispatch system. So when you call 911, they can tell you, hey, there's an AED in the building. You know, here's where it's at. Here's how you use it. You guys have that extra uh, level of, uh, of service. Um, 
And for, so all those things that the public can do for us, in addition to the research and the work with our hospital partners, uh, our protocols and our equipment, and making sure our training is uh, a top notch, that all comes together for a community in the response to cardiac arrest. In our community, uh, we have a resuscitation rate of nearly 50% compared with 20% found in most communities. What that means is that um, when someone's in cardiac arrest, either at the time when we get called or while we're taking care of that, our paramedics are able to resuscitate them and deliver them to the hospital with vital signs when they get there, So, which is a significant, you know, it's double what you typically see in, uh, in the United States. So again, those efforts are really combined with uh, all those things that I talked about. So the second thing I want to talk about is pediatric care. You know, we have to be prepared to provide care for patients of any age in any location uh, with any kind of medical condition. So we have to be deliberate about uh, having the proper equipment, training, uh, medications, uh, make sure our members are, are prepared for that. We have a collaboration with the uh, University of Florida Shands and six other EMS systems in Florida where we submit data to them and researchers uh, look at that data to identify ways to improve care <laughs> specifically to kids. They identified asthma, something you heard earlier talked about. Um, people don't always have access to prescriptions and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but we run into to kids with asthma issues. Um, and, and something very simple that they identified throughout this process was that the way that our paramedics administer one of the medications is through an injection, which sometimes is not the easiest thing to do for the kid. And that we weren't always able to give them that dosing of medication consistently because of that. So that research, they, we made one simple change, change that, the delivery of that medication from an IV route to an oral substance they just drink, um, which has resulted in uh, decreased hospitalization rates and decreased ICU stays, which are important with kids and really with everybody that we, we deal with. The last area I want to talk to you about is the social service referral program. Many of the, the, the people, the community partners you saw here, earlier today, um, we, we have interactions with, with this. The vast majority of what we do is responding to emergencies, uh, people that experience those issues. We do see people that have other needs or needs that impact their health. Um, whether it's access to food, mobility, they can't get in and out of their house, they don't have prescriptions, um, they might not have good shelter, it might be, you know, environmental conditions of where they, they're at. Um, they, we see people every day that, that are impacted by many of the social determinants of health. Whether, uh, and whatever, whatever causes that may result in the person calling EMS frequently. So we see this over and over again with certain patient populations that the person, you know, they have a legitimate reason to call an ambulance, but they probably could avoid it if they had access to some other thing. So we have a program, a partnership with many of these community partners. We work with Schenken Shop um, and, and the HSCP group uh, with, with these things quite a bit. Uh, when our paramedics go to that person and they continuously go to them, they recognize that maybe this is really uh, something else that we need to provide service for. Uh, it, again, this is a small number of our overall calls. It's a handful a month, but I just want to leave you with one real life example. So we had an elderly lady who was in her 90s who was calling the ambulance frequently, several times a week. The paramedics identified that there was something else that was obviously contributing to this, noticing the environment when they got there. They identified, you know, this was in the winter. Um, she had no heat. There was uh, very limited uh, food availability. She wasn't getting her prescriptions filled. You know, the list goes on of all the reasons why we kept going back. They were able to, to talk to her about this program. Uh, we do have to have the person consent to allow us to share that information with the outside Agencies, she did that. They brought the uh, 211, made those connections with all those community partners. They were able to insulate the house, fix her heat, get her food, get her medications on, on board, get her to, you know, primary care. And we, as far as I know, we've never been back there. So that's, you know, that's how we can help with those vulnerable populations that Certainly we see um, the advantage that our paramedics have is that they go to your homes and they see the conditions that you're, that you're living in 
And the, when they're able to share that and make those connections, that certainly makes a big difference in outcome in many of those patients. So, yeah, this is just three examples out of many <clears throat> of the results we, we can uh, achieve by advancing the strategic initiative and really aligning our resources uh, to, to have um, these types of outcomes. So, um, anyway, be available for any questions along the way. If there's anything else, uh, yeah, I don't know what Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vince, I really want to give you a shout out. Uh, the spirit of, uh, of having a, um, didn't think it were, but I think you said social worker uh, on board to in, who, who encounters a large segment of the homeless population that comes to the library uh, is really visionary. Uh, Sabrum's comments that um, uh, they take note of where they are picking people up on these emergency uh, visits and not just looking at it and say, oh my, what deplorable conditions, but actually intervening to uh, send help back to the voiceless and persons who largely probably have no, no idea where to go. Um, this signals a uh, very... Um, humanitarian orientation that I, as one commissioner, appreciate, respect, and value. And I think that uh, besides the dollars and the cents of spending and those things, these are the things that, that uh, add value or are, are, are rather that our entities of, of uh, service, these instruments of service add value that you can't, you can't you can't quantify or qualify um, on a sheet of paper. So recognizing, and I've heard uh, the comments from Ms. Monroe before, I'm excited about that direction. And I thank you all because it's uh, extending that, that heart um, thingy that we, uh, is thingy a word, that a noun? Thingy. Thingy, that's a noun. Uh, it reaches to the public. So thanks, Vince, for that. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I was thinking <clears throat> that along with uh, Carrie Post, that our, our library, uh, and I was just thinking about what is the, the symbol of, of Leon County? And um, certainly the courthouse is not, at least not for District 1, but maybe our downtown public library. And next year, in our 200th anniversary, uh, I was thinking that maybe we need to, along with Carrie's office, make the library information center uh, central. And um, I was thinking about it and I jot down some things, um, commissioners, that um, that 200 year block party down in, in library, um, and they've been to a 200 year birthday party. <laughs> I don't know what you do. I guess you just stand up and just, <laughs> that's amazing. We we'll get some steps for it. Um, I believe that um, during Women's History Month, the 200th year, we ought to have special readings uh, on women, the evolution of women in Leon County. Uh, what what that evolution has been. Uh, African American History Month. Uh, I like to sponsor that party um, for. And I think that public readings around the 200th birthday, and um, we, we just go all out and our community knows that uh, our downtown public library becomes a uh, uh, Leon County uh, headquarters for disseminating, celebrating, <clears throat> and doing a lot of the things that we do. I would encourage that, you know, we had something about the oldest schoolhouse in the state of Florida is out there in um, Commissioner Welch's district. Uh, very proud of that building, over a million dollars or so. You know, really, um, lots of pride. But that history of education, 200 years, and to have um, three major uh, higher education entities that combine uh, probably have 300 years of educating um, is important. I love to see that captured in oral histories presented um, through our 
library, uh, our churches, uh, that history, um, and something programmed around that. Um, we've got a bishop <clears throat> of uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, come from Bethel AME Church. Uh, uh, Judge uh, Monique Richardson's father, uh, Pastor A.J. Richardson, um, significant historic figures um, emanating from our churches. Um, I mean, that is just so much. And I'm not trying to burden and tax y'all staff, but I feel that this too is a part of the 200th year, our birthday. And we're going to have a hell of a birthday party all year. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that thing go from January 1 to all the way to the end of the year, our 200th birthday party. But readings and oral histories and a place where information and uh, what's that word? Um, pamphlets and all of that about our history ought to be pamphlets. Um, I just might write a book myself. Um, that, that would be crazy, wouldn't it? Can I write a book? Legal? Can I edit it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, uh, Senator George Santos is going to be my producer. So <laughs> That's good. Re Representative George Santos will be my producer. Okay. <laughs> will be all that accurate. Um, we're excited about the things that can occur. So I would like to offer those things, uh, not as hardcore policy, but lending itself to the flavor of what 2024 can be for our community. Thank you, sir. Commissioner O'Keefe. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, real quick, I just want to um, say thank you both Chief Abrams and Ms. Rowe, Ms. Rowe for clearly always going above and beyond. Um, I was fortunate enough to visit with Chief Abrams and uh, he talked about the award they got um, for how they respond to heart attack and stroke patients. And I wanted to highlight this as another example of Leon County finding ways to partner with institutions. In this case, they were the first, at least in Florida, if not um, uh, elsewhere, to coordinate with our local hospitals to be able to send results of labs from the field so that doctors were waiting when they arrived at the hospital to significantly increase outcomes. And I want to highlight that. I don't think, except for when we're in emergency, we don't get to hear those things. Um, and then Ms. Monroe, uh, just what the library is doing here is amazing. Um, personally, I want to thank you for having a library of things. I have uh, checked out the power tools and circular saws. Um, and uh, video converters. And uh, my wife used to buy about 50 books a year. And five years ago, I showed her the online checkout books. <laughs> and we, um, our retirement is going to be a lot better. <laughs> and then, um, and then all, all kidding aside, um, having that community resource officer is incredibly valuable. Um, in my own family, um, we, we were, um, uh, the impact of having a good caseworker um, get involved with us can't be understated. And so to have access to our citizens for that, which is not easy to get to. Um, so often it's not until you're in the ER and getting discharged that you hope to get a good caseworker. And so doing this at the library, um, you have my full support and um, I just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, Springboarding off of what Commissioner O'Keefe just said, I, you know, I have two young girls and we went to the, uh, the, the STEM event, the book feast at Lake Jackson Library. Amazing, incredible. Um, and the Lego Saturdays that the libraries have too. It's just, I mean, it's just, it really is amazing. I mean, not only, I mean, you have a, a wide age spectrum to accommodate and you, 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 you accommodate all those ages, uh, with seniors and children. So thanks to everything that you do. I really appreciate it. And, and, um, uh, Chief, you know, I, Years ago, when, when I uh, just was elected, I went on a ride along with some of your staff. And to this day, I haven't forgotten that night. I, I saw some things I, it, it, I never quite understood how often every single day your staff make things work and save lives until I went on that ride along. So uh, I will always remember that as long as I'm, as long as I'm here. And then, um, I also wanted to thank Shington. Is he still here, Shington? Listen, uh, you know, the work that you and your staff did on the uh, food insecurity effort, uh, with Second Harvest and the city of Tallahassee going around and, and talking to neighbors about what their barriers were to food security, I thought was terrific. And um, I just want to thank everything that you guys did 
uh, to make that happen and look forward to the, the continuing work on that, because that really was just the first start on, on, on identifying those issues. And then the ongoing work is removing those barriers, right? So uh, kudos to you and your team. And then finally, this is a thank fest right here, but um, I want to thank, I want to thank the board because if uh, last year we, we added um, the citizens task, uh, the citizens North Monroe task force recommendations to our strategic initiative. Uh, when we formulated our, our first year of the five year, uh, plan. And so I, I want to thank this board for your support. Uh, we're working real hard on trying to, to turn Northern Road back, have a lot of work to do still, but, but I really support, I really appreciate the support from this board on, on, on that stretch of, uh, corridor in the community. And, uh, with that, that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Mr. Chairman, I heard the, uh, our library, Ms. Monroe say that, uh, she, 140,000 people have library cards. Is that what you said? Sorry, 146,000 have library cards. And, um, I, and, and she wanted to grow that number. And, um, I did ask our county attorney if, you know, if she possibly, um, could put some language on that library card that, uh, there's a 25% discount at ABCs that we get a lot of cards. Um, probably destroy it, but she hadn't given me an answer on the, whether or not we could get that discount with that library card, uh, Mr. Chairman. So thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just real briefly, I just want to say again, thank you guys. It's interesting because you both really are providing a frontline service just in very different ways. Um, and obviously, uh, Chief Abrams, tremendous respect for all you guys do in the, in the shop that you run, but particularly last year helping bring online another ambulance into the community, you know, sort of operate now that Northeast library branch parking lot, which is a, a huge help to response times all throughout the community and particularly the Northeast. So thank you all so much for everything you do. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Anything else? I'm sorry. I realize I'm the only female on the commission. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Never see me. <laughs> You see me? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to ditto all the great compliments that have come from my fellow commissioners and, and our librarian is just doing a tremendous job. We know um, she has some tremendous shoes to fill and she is certainly doing it in style. Um, I think we recognize her, her innovation. Uh, and I live out east, even though I don't think it's one of the initiatives, but what you done with the library out at Pedrick. Pedrick and it's just it's innovative and it's tremendous. So we thank you for all of your your hard work and you just put uh another pin in what a library is supposed to be. You know, we grew up, you go you check out your books. Uh, my parents couldn't afford to buy books, so we would check books out from the library to read. But it's just been an extension with all the innovation. So we appreciate you. Chief Abrams, your group is tremendous. I had personal experience this year with EMS. My mom is 97 and we had occasion to call. They were there in less than five minutes. Did a tremendous job. She's still living. So <laughs> she'll be 98 in two weeks. So I just Coming want to, to thank you all. <laughs> uh, thank you all for the tremendous work that you do for our community, for our citizens in the community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I'm sorry, Commissioner. Madam Vice Chair, coming. I'm so sorry, my peripheral vision isn't working today. It's old football injury, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> next part. Thank you, and, and thank you. Let me just say, Commissioners, as these two head off, thematically, you may have picked up on something here. Pamela said uh, th these two had a very similar kind of theme to their presentation. Pamela said, we're just getting started. And uh, Chad said, we're just getting you restarted on the cardiac arrest. Uh, so with that, um, Matt, I just wanted to do that to you. Uh, let me let me just say, commissioners, uh, the, our final category here in the area of governance, we've got nine strategic uh, initiatives here. We've got uh, two of our most introverted uh, presenters here with Matt Cavell and, and Candace. Wilson, so please make them feel comfortable. Uh, Matt, I'm going to hand it off to you. So I'm just saying, Vince, 
you save the best for last. And I, and I know Candace will agree. So, um, so consider us uh, your dessert to your favorite lunch. <laughs> I may be the huge cobbler, banana pudding, maybe. Banana pudding, <laughs> God, you can buy that up. So as Vince has said, following EMS is always the easiest job in the world. So community and media relations has saved zero lives uh, this year <laughs> that we know of. Uh, but we like to imagine that it's more. But hey, look, in, I'm going to get to this strategic initiative. I'm chomping at the bit to get there. But what I want to do is explain in real brief terms the work that we do throughout the year. And that's in community relations and resilience. That's all informed by the effort and direction put into the strategic plan. So that is that we have, at all the programs you've heard, out of everyone using library cards and everyone getting the library of things and people knowing what they need to do for this, that, and the other, and it comes to affordable housing, our job is to make sure that they know that. So over the course of the year, we've issued more than 10 million different ways to reach people's ears or eyes or heart. 10 million times over the course of the year. And that is more than ever before, because as we've seen throughout today's presentations, we're doing more than ever before, as informed by the strategic plan. Also, earned media this year is through the roof. Hundreds of stories about Leon County services, library lecture series, the importance of the retreat today, and so on and so forth. I say that because not only is that hundreds of thousands of free dollars of marketing and advertising, which I know Alan's a fan of, but in addition to that, that's nearly a Ken Burnsian documentary length of Leon County coverage that occurs on local news stations. And that's not even mentioning print. <laughs> so the amount of engagement that we have for the services that we offer is intense, but we always need to do more because there's not 300,000 library card holders yet. That is our focus in community relations and resilience is making people aware of the essential services that are articulated within the strategic plan that we work day in and day out to fulfill. And we continue to do that also through emergency management, which is part of the function of community relations and resilience, which is, as Vince often mentions, the first FEMA designated hurricane strong community in the nation. We are also the training mecca for the entire region. This is where everyone in Northeast, Northwest, and North Dakota <laughs> comes for training. This is where state offices decide to operate their operations is within our county emergency operations center because we have the trained staff, we have the utility, and we have the state of our facility. So all of that, big leader in emergency management as well. In fact, in the world of communications, just a year ago, we were right here earning every local public relations award they had except for a handful, and probably because those were only available to students. Because we were in this room with Florida Public Relations Association being recognized for the programs that we advertise. So I say all that to Greg, obviously. But I say all that because there is still an incredible amount of work to do. Specific to the <laughs> coming, this is 20 words on a slide, but it is 365 days of work. So be very clear that out of this, which says community engagement, diverse backgrounds, and hosting engaging citizen engagement events, <clears throat> that is a simple statement in a book, but we live it every day. So we have engaged tens of thousands of citizens in library programs and the work that you see on this board. We just had mentioned Pedrick Pond, KCCI, public art projects. That was a realization of our partnership with Community Catalysts, Betsy Couch, KCCI, and in addition, 50 plus private partners who sponsored and helped produce that reality at Pedrick Pond, in addition to expanding it to Woodville Incorporated. That's what these community events and partnerships allow us to do, is to amplify the good work that is already articulated within our strategic plan and to increase our efforts each and every day. And again, this is a guiding light along with all the other strategic initiatives that we do each and every day. So again, real quick overview and a little bit of bragging, so please forgive, but um, but I just wanted to, again, underscore the importance of this in our day-to-day -day work and appreciate the work that you're doing here today. So with that, I'd like to bring up Candace Wilson. Good afternoon. So as Matt said, Saving the best for last. Good afternoon. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you um, to present today. Um, everything that you've heard today is because of the hard work of all of our county employees. We have the awesome job of helping to bring those employees into our organization. Um, my role today is to talk about one particular strategic initiative, which is just dropping the bucket of everything that we do here in Leon County uh, uh, government and HR. 
It is to continue to invest in the professional development of county staff, including participation in the certified public manager's training program and enhancements to the county management training. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to let you know, of course, our role, we have an awesome role, right, in HR. We have the responsibility of ensuring that all of our new employees understand our culture, understand their role as an employee, understand what's expected of them and what they can expect of us, right? And so just a couple of points on how we keep employees engaged. It's through a couple, couple areas. People want to be acknowledged for the work that they do. And as you see here today, it's been an amazing amount of work done um, with all the initiatives. And this, again, was a drop in the bucket with everything that, you know, this county does as a whole. And so we reward them and we acknowledge them through our awards and recognition program. Commissioners, you were at the uh, employee celebration breakfast where we acknowledged some, some phenomenal work that was being done in, um, in our uh, in the county from uh, select employees with some of the projects that they were doing. So that's called, uh, part of that is our I Squared Award, which um, are employee-led projects that are either inspiring or innovative and they highlight the county's core practices and core values. Um, one of the other things that I really love is that we have what's called a WOW Award. And you can do that, on, we can do that on any given day, right? Someone does something in the moment that you saw and it's like, wow, they didn't even have to do that. They went that extra mile. We can acknowledge them right then in that moment and let them know, hey, I saw you. And that just gives so much credence to their hard work and encourages them to want to do more. Um, the other thing we do in HR, of course, is retention and recruitment. And, you know, making sure we have a competitive benefit package. You know, recently, commissioners, you um, voted to increase our minimum pay to $15, right? Um, of course, money helps. Uh, when you talk about bringing individuals in, uh, we also provide parental leave, which allows parents six weeks of paid time off when they have that newborn to spend time for bonding and uh, spending time with their newborn. Um, and we also have a uh, deferred uh, compensation match program, which um, we provide to employees to uh, give them 3%, match them 3% of their annual salary, and so much more. I'm just hitting on just a couple. Um, we also had last year, a uh, year before, um, the hiring on the spot where we were able, and you've heard probably in some of the materials, where we were able to fill 100% of our positions just by being out in the community and asking, you know, bringing individuals in and <clears throat> hiring them on the spot. So amazing event. Um, but as I previously spoke about, we have the CPM program that we, um, we that's one of our strategic initiatives. and. Really, the, the CPM program is not just a small program. This is a really big deal because it's nationally recognized. Uh, it's a management development program for public managers and supervisors. Right now, it's been offered in 38 states, but we have the awesome opportunity to partner with um, FSU, uh, with the ASCU School of Public Administration. Their, their curriculum covers a full spectrum of management, beginning with the individual performance, and gradually expanding to broader organizational issues and public policy. And of course, this program works perfectly for what we try to achieve every day in Leon County regard, in regards to our core practices and core values. Why is this program important? It helps us to develop our uh, next level leadership uh, for our succession plan. So these individuals are top-notch employees who um, or that we want to uh, utilize as um, in the next in line for succession planning. It is a two-year commitment. So it's not a class you go into one day. It's a two-year commitment um, for those employees, and they're able to come out of there with some ideas for us, like how can we improve some of the things that we do here at Leon County? So we really garner from that. We get uh, a gift from that. To date, we've had 18 employees over the years that have participated in that. Many of them have gone on to be over managed departments. Um, in addition to uh, the CPM program, the county continues to invest in professional development of county staff through our Leon Learns trainings. Um, there's a variety of training opportunities available. Um, HR does customized training, which can be tailored for an individual's 
uh, individual employees need. Uh, we have we've had trained through lunch and learns for um, customer experience, supervisory training, diversity, educational. I mean, sorry, emotional resilience, achieving a healthy work life balance, and mental health. Did you know mental health is a big issue? Um, we also have a repository of hundreds of professional training classes through our um, Leon uh, Learns portal, self-paced, that individuals can go out and pick certain trainings to look at to, to work on their own personal development to prepare them again to be able to move forward in the organization. Last year alone, we had 1,100 <laughs> visits to county-sponsored activities, whether they were at the wellness fair, whether they were at classes, um, those kinds of things, we have 1,100 visits. Um, I'm happy to say that I, we all appreciate the county's um, investment into our wellness program. Our wellness program gets us to make sure that, you know, we're all healthy, can't sit at the desk all day. What can we do? We can do yoga. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite pictures that I remember seeing is um, our department uh, going out to public works and seeing the really tall guys trying to stand on one leg, you know, trying to get the, learn to find their center and get their balance. It was part of a yoga class. And believe it or not, it's one of their favorite classes is for, for the guys out at Public Works who want to go to um, a yoga class. But we're always trying to think of ways, how can we improve the health of our employees? Um, we've had 3,600 visits to our Live Well Leon activities, whether they were events, whether they're screenings or actual trainings. <clears throat> um, most recently, commissioners tying into the professional development. Uh, you may remember back in November was your very first night, so I don't know if you remember. You're so excited, some of you. Um, you approved uh, two new uh, incentive certification programs for our employees so that they we will recognize them and pay them to uh, move forward up in the organization. And um, we have educational attainment incentive pay and tuition reimbursement. So if you want to go back to school, we'll help you go back to school. That's one thing I love about Lima County. I will tell you all day long, I love this organization. And I love how uh, Leon County and the leadership um, is always supportive of um, all that we do. One of the great things I want to go back to the CPM this year, um, the keynote speaker for uh, in in the spring will be not only uh, will be our very own Vince Long. So he will be the keynote yeah, I speaker didn't know for, <laughs> for graduation this year. So I'm um, looking forward to that. It is, um, with that, commissioners, that's what I have. Do you have any questions? Both Matt and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. You and Matt both for your comprehensive presentations, Commissioner Park. The Chairman, Commissioners, there's no doubt that um, Matt and, 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 and um, Candace are uh, the front lines, the face of our organization. Um, you don't come to our organization without coming through uh, HR. Um, that's first base, actually. And um, my ears are constantly open for um, blowback um, about people's experience with efforts to attain employment and opportunity in Leon County. And um, really consistently, I really don't hear uh, a lot of rattle or tattle about things that are not going professionally uh, with our program and I, I have to I mean we don't have the top county administrator in the world but nothing but certainly uh, this is one of the reasons why and uh, Candace thank you uh, because <laughs> you just have no idea <laughs> how many people <clears throat> call me like I'm the HR director <laughs> or Rachel Rachel knows more about folk looking for a job in Tallahassee and I know, but y'all's office is sweet, uh, polite, kind to people who are making that inquiry and people who are um, really needing help. Thank you for your professional staff and all that y'all do. And then Matt, um, you convey our story to the public and uh, we can't say enough about you during COVID uh, and crisis management. Um, 
uh, you work with Mr. Abrams with, um, what's that thing? Um, uh, hurricane season kickoff. Uh, your office is, is behind all initiatives that we try to launch and nothing but respect for the talent that you display, uh, the coordination, you know, events, um, just name it. Y'all take care of it. Um, shouts out. If it was different, I wouldn't lie to you. I really wouldn't. I wouldn't fool you. But um, I'm very pleased and excited by the high standard that um, you all representing the face of our organization. You, you, you do it very well. Vince, I want to thank you and encourage you to make sure that these employees get raises when it's appropriate in time. <laughs> they doing a great job. I thought that was it. I that was it. <laughs> uh, great job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Proctor. All right, seeing no one. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, then, uh, you Mr. Mr. Chair. When I do it, you still don't see it. Come on, give me an hour. Yeah, you got called out. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Chair. I just didn't want to miss this opportunity to just come in and Mr. Cavell and Ms. Wilson. I mean, they do a tremendous job. I know we are, uh, we're over time, we're pressed for time. But um, they're so professional in their own right. And so I think they and their staff and their big boss uh, certainly needs uh, commending because they make us they make us look good. Uh, their their shops are seamless. I've dealt with individuals that work under them and they are knowledgeable as well. So I just thank you all for all you do for, for Leon County, for the citizens of Leon County and how you you help the commissioners anytime we need it. You are there. So thank you so much. All right. Commissioner Miner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What uh, Vice Chair Cummings and Mr. Parker said. Thank you very much. Anything else? I'm now we'll move on to the next thing, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say to round this out. Um, uh, also, want to thank you heard from just a few, a couple of our great division directors here. Um, needless to say, the rest of our team, you, you see out here, we just kind of, again, picked a couple of strategic initiatives in the categories. Um, and so in addition to our management team, of course, we acknowledge all the people throughout the organization that are carrying these out. It, 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 um, it doesn't escape me that I need to also, you didn't hear from them, but people who are making sure that all this stays on track. Uh, Alan Rosenzweig, Deputy County Administrator, Wanda Hunter, our Assistant County Administrator, and Ken Morris, um, our Assistant County Administrator. You gotta give them big, big kudos. And that is their race, by the way. Uh, for No, no, uh, <laughs> but for keeping all this on track. Uh, we hope that that was um, helpful. Again, uh, oftentimes, especially at times like this, again, we'll, we will, present to you a number of initiatives, um, uh, a summary, it will, uh, we'll, we'll convert them into percentages complete and that sort of thing. But our real objective here was to give you an idea and sort of the, the color commentary behind um, what each of these strategic initiatives really entails uh, in terms of the collective effort and, and the, uh, the, the strategic approach throughout the organization and the alignment of resources required to, to get them done. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just quickly um, say that uh, uh, that concludes uh, that part. I'll, I'll look toward toward you, Mr. Chair, to see if uh, uh, you'd like us to uh, take a break or to keep rolling. You guys good? We'll take a break. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Keep like, rolling. So look, we're going to move on now to our strategic initiatives uh, to add or amend an, 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 an initiative, table, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's going to be. A, it's going to take a super majority vote. Um, our county administrator is going Thank to lead us off with some of the. Uh, absolutely. This. This will. Thank prepare. you. Absolutely. This. This will be. This will be uh, quick. We'll jump right into it, commissioners. Yeah. Uh, again, moving on to our final section, uh, which the board will have, have the opportunity again to amend or add strategic initiatives to the current 22-26 plan. Uh, as you know, commissioners, the county's strategic plan, again, a living document. It's intended to reflect the changing needs, uh, conditions, opportunities um, a, 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 in, of the organization and our community. With that in mind, the board uh, may wish to add new strategic initiatives, including your re uh, retreat materials. And as shown on the screen here, 
uh, we've included a list of proposed strategic initiatives for consideration um, in, in this update year. The list represents, in many cases, the next logical step of an existing initiative. Um, uh, and and uh, at this point, I want to turn the meeting back over to our chairman to facilitate the identification of new strategic initiatives, which the board will call uh, will be included as part of a ratification item that will come back to the board uh, and be presented uh, at an upcoming meeting. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. So, of course, out of respect, I go by seniority here, and I'll start with our immediate past chairman, Commissioner Proctor, and work our way down the line there. Commissioner Proctor, do you have any initiatives for us? Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to offer uh, for our board to consider uh, that we revisit uh, the private road issue in paving uh, roads. Uh, I guess I go by a initiative some years ago, um, even under Tony Parks or Mike Willett, I can't remember, um, where we used to take about 10 roads that we made as a priority that we would uh, pave, that we would address. I know that those roads likely were public roads, and we, um, we, uh, uh, I think we did some cold mix, um, cold COLD mix pavement on those county roads. But I'd like to see uh, some modification of uh, our private roads policies, um, public access uh, for emergency vehicles. Um, in many of these roads, and um, the cost, like eggs, um, has gone up, and roads have gone up even more, and many of these citizens will never be able to afford uh, the roads. Uh, I feel uh, the heat of our general counsel about to tell me that we can't, we can't do this, we can't do that, and whatnot. <laughs> but, uh, Notwithstanding, it's our job to say we can. It's our job to say we can, and um, and I'm asking us to do our job that we we look at the road policy and discover something. In in terms of a ratio, will tell you it's the other thing we get ate up on is 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 what y'all gonna do to help us with our road, and we're always left to say uh, we'll look into it, knowing that uh, our staff. Uh, uh, Brent is going to go out there and give the little dog and pony, and um, nothing's going to be done. What can we do, um, and, and can we adopt a, a new initiative to really aid, uh, alleviate uh, roads that the, the mailman can't go down, the school bus can't go down, um, the emergency can't go down uh, without getting stuck? Is this the best we can do, or we, we just have to go to the status quo? Yes. Again, just to help facilitate commissioners, you know, Commissioner Proctor, just to show he's always on top of it. We've got an item coming back to you at your next meeting. And again, uh, so we may want to reflect this, you know, as a, as a, as an administrative item, but we've got an item coming at your net, which was requested by the board, uh, at your next meeting to go over all of our paving programs, all of our, uh, road improvement programs, um, on both public and, and, and private uh, roads. And we'll be doing a, a thorough uh, evaluation of that and a thorough um, a presentation to the board on all of those and even identifying uh, some places where we um, uh, can make some improvements. So that's coming to you at your next meeting. And again, based on that, again, the board may wish to provide us direction, uh, additional direction, uh, but you, you'll see an awful lot of analysis reflected on each of our individual programs. Like for example, we've got emergency road assistance programs where we'll go out at no cost to anyone and ensure that a uh, an emergency a piece of equipment can get to um, to where they need to on road. that's just one of our programs but again we've got an item coming to you at the just at the next meeting well mr chairman i withdraw um that as an offer for strategic but i would like my final point um if the floor is open yes sir you wanted us to go through these one by one, or we going around first, and then we'll come back to those on the screen. Give me all yours right now. Okay. Uh, that that our board would partner with the city of Tallahassee, the Capital City Chamber, and uh, other local stakeholders mm -hmm. to um, increase economic growth, financial security, in neighborhoods that have historically been um, um, left out, um, impoverished, 
and have faced um, inequity. Um, and we'd like to do that through um, an initiative through uh, uh, to include the bank on Tallahassee. And this is an economic uh, request. Okay. Category. All right. Uh, we have place it up on the board. Is that it, Commissioner Proctor? Anything else from you? That's it, sir. All Thank right. You. We'll move now on. We, what I'm going to do is I want to add all of these, and then we're going to take them all uh, in motion. That's okay. Uh, Commissioner Miner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, there's been, for many years, we've talked about the restoration of the passenger rail. Uh, was the, the old Sunset Limited route that went between Pensacola to Jacksonville. And so, as, as you all know, um, the, the federal government, Congress passed the Infrastructure, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which um, for the first time in many years has some money allocated which could be used for infrastructure specifically for passenger rail restoration. So what I'd like to do is offer um, the following, uh, engaging local and regional, regional, state and federal partners to encourage the restoration of passenger rail service along the Gulf Coast by leveraging federal dollars under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And this would pertain to the economy category, of course. Um, it's an uphill battle. Uh, our, our legislative delegation, um, our congressional delegation, our governor um, have not really gotten on board with uh, restoring passenger rail service along the Gulf Coast, um, but you do have Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana that have joined the Southern Rail Commission working together to get rail um, restored uh, along that route within their state borders, and they're doing it. Uh, so if we have the ability to uh, work with our governor, our, our, our congressional delegation, our state legislature, to start, to start conveying to them how important this is, uh, not just to Tallahassee, but to Northern Florida in general, uh, I think it'd be a big boon for us. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, um, um, as you know, we've, we've been working for uh, a while now on North Monroe and have a various different projects that are underway. One thing I'd like to do is uh, propose the development of an interactive community web-based tool that documents the planned improvements, tracks investments, and identifies enhancement strategies for the North Monroe corridor area. And this would be a quality of life category. Um, you probably get a lot of the same requests that I do about, you know, how things are going with North Monroe, where are we now, uh, what projects are moving forward, which ones need, we still need to uh, work on and get started. And this um, this web-based tool would help us achieve that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Last one is... Um, he said last. The last time that was his last. <laughs> no. No, I didn't say that. Final, final. I did. That was <laughs> And I, I want to thank everyone here on the board for the uh, uh, supporting the Citizens North Monroe Task Force final report. Um, what I'd like to do is to build on that task force report by having an intensive multi-day design charrette that would work with the community to identify and evaluate a variety of land use and planning strategies and other proposals for the continued improvement of the North Monroe corridor area. And this would be another economy category. Uh, basically, we, we, could, we could build upon the task force report have this charrette engage many members of the community, um, in addition to the ones that are on the, on the citizens task force and, uh, and, and identify some things that we can do in the next, I'd say the two to five years. So, right. and that is my last one. Thanks for So you got Thank three you. initiatives from me. All right. Commissioner uh, Cummings. Madam Vice Chair. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, propose an initiative on the quality of life and I want to thank staff for for assisting me in this particular uh, endeavor, I'd like to uh, propose that we partner with the Children's Services Council to address <clears throat> the health of women and children and specifically the health of African-American women and children in our um, marginalized communities by coordinating and sharing data uh, by collaborating with partners on local community <laughs> resources to see how we can manage investments in outreach and awareness to improve our health outcomes. And we've got specific statistics throughout our agenda today, uh, we heard from the Early Learning Coalition and our, our community help partners. So I think 
Oh, and we also heard from uh, the chair of the, the executive director of the Children's Services Council. So I think it's going to take a partnership of all of our partners, the nonprofits that are concerned about elevating the health um, and welfare of our citizens in the county, but I specifically say uh, our minority uh, women and children, because that's where the dire statistics show that we really need to move the needle uh, for our children's health and for our, our the health of our mothers and our women. So that is what I'm proposing, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Cummings. You have any other? That, that's the only one that I have. That's the only one. Thank you, Thank you Madam Vice Chair. I will move now to Commissioner Welch. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a couple as, as we have done, I think it was a couple years ago, we moved, made a strategic initiative to relocate the Northeast Park. And with your support, uh, we've been able to do that. And obviously uh, at Blueprint have been able to get it funded and, and ready to rock and roll. So I would like to elevate it to a strategic initiative to design and construct the new Northeast Park which uh, obviously is a huge quality of life amenity for Northeast Tallahassee and my constituents uh, and something that I am uh, very proud of. So that would be my first one. All right. Second. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, Delatry Hollinger came to me as well as Colonel Host, my, one of my predecessors uh, in District 4, about creating some kind of historical reference within the courthouse to county commissioners and throughout our you know, history. Um, I initially approached the county administrator about this and it became obvious pretty quickly that that was the scope of that was fairly unfeasible. We have a lot of history that we can't track down about who were county commissioners and, and things like that. So um, a, a sort of an alternative was this idea of developing a touchscreen kiosk to go into the courthouse that will provide an overview. Uh, it lines up with our bicentennial. Uh, 200 years of representation in progress, highlighting current and past county officials, significant county achievements and projects by decade, and a historical overview of Leon County. So imagine like a touch screen kiosk that'll uh, be somewhere in the courthouse <clears throat> where citizens can come in and they can type up Commissioner Bill Proctor and they can uh, find references to Commissioner Proctor and his lengthy service to the county and all of the things that he did over his multiple decades uh, of service and I think that's really cool as a history teacher. Um, it is not lost on me when I get off the elevator and see the list of names on those plaques that, uh, you know, some names of some famous names on that plaque that I don't really know anything about. Uh, there's a guy named Bannerman on that plaque who I assume the road in my district is named after and I don't really know anything about him. So to the extent that we can find out some information about those folks, I think it's a cool, uh, place, a depository, if you will, of information about not just county commissioners, but also county administrators and county attorneys uh, and, and staff that made significant contributions. And so that would be my second one. All right. I, I would suggest augmenting his recommendation would be to uh, include those commissioners um, in the details of the history of Leon County um, for 2024. I think that should be prominently uh, located in, in literature that celebrates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first initiative is through the Blueprint Agency, evaluate opportunities to advance the construction of the Tharp Street project. Uh, I'm not sure if that would qualify under economy or quality of life. I think it would be a little bit of both. Number two would be work with the city of Tallahassee, Big Bend Continuum of Care, the street, out, uh, street outreach teams to develop corridor plans for North Monroe, downtown, and Pensacola Street, for outreach to unsheltered homeless individuals and to engage residents and businesses to address the community aesthetics and neighborhood safety along those corridors. I believe that'll be quality of life. All right, that's it? Yes, sir. Sure, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have three. Yes, sir. And these, uh, the first is quality of life. Um, this builds on actually the Chairman's comments earlier about um, mixed income housing throughout our community. Um, We've re had recent success, so the priority would be continue to leverage county funding in partnership with local stakeholders to secure state and federal funding to build affordable rental housing 
for very low and low income families. All right. The second quality of life um, follows up on Commissioner Caban's and an issue that we hear a lot about because it's a, a growing problem is homelessness. Um, we, that we leverage federal funding and relationships with local service providers, providers to increase the number of temporary and transitional housing beds available to those experiencing homeless, homelessness. All right. And then finally, this is an a, economy piece and um, the, to start the, the initiative would be collaborate with regional partners in the building and technical trades industries to increase entry level apprenticeship opportunities, specifically immediate hiring with training on the job positions. The background here is we target a lot of educated and uh, technology based jobs and we have um, lively tech and programs like that. But we are like many communities, um, very short on building trades workforce that impacts our ability to build developments and affordable housing. And those are jobs that traditionally and in other communities can be hired on the spot and start on the job training. This would not only help all of those efforts, but it would give long term career prospects for folks that do not want or do not have the ability to pursue formal education. All right. Thank you. You got those three? You got them? Here. Okay. Did you get a second go round? I guess that's just it. Because you probably like to get a second go round. So he had two two lasses over there. <laughs> <laughs> President Vini staff. Go for it. You know my ADD kicks in and I just can't decompensate just out of that. Commissioners, I um, pondered whether or not we uh, would desire to pick up the summer youth program um, and possibly uh, frame uh, in our budget mm -hmm. possibility. I thought we were doing wonderful when we were bringing students um, and placing them all across. And then COVID came and it became wiser not to uh, bring anyone in uh, to our buildings and, and, and staff. Uh, I like to offer um, that we lead the way and continue to be a guiding light and open door for young people to have access to government and um, something in our notes about uh, under governance, uh, transparency. And I think there's nothing greater than transparency than to actually welcome young people throughout the corridors to uh, know uh, that a woman is the county's attorney. Uh, and those kinds of things uh, it spurs uh, their perceptions of what they can do. So I'd like to offer summer youth uh, and continuing youth. It may not just be summer, but continuing efforts to be a flagship for opportunity for the young folk. All right. You got that one up there? Yeah. And secondly, uh, give me a second. Uh, Make sure we got it. Yeah, we're getting it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Then okay. second, um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, um, uh, Commissioner um, Welch said something about beds and um, it, it triggered mental health beds. And are we, will we, uh, does it even matter if we are a community that um, has a transitional beds or do we um, allow Mr. Um, from Appalachia to be the sole uh, overcrowded, overworked, overexhausted facility, Appalachian Mental. But there is a need for uh, uh, mid-level um, timeout uh, beds and so forth. And we were in pursuit of uh, this goal uh, to secure in, in, in the capital of Florida uh, options that we just, just don't have and uh, mental health. Um, I looked at uh, the pages and that out of that 1.7 million, I think we had $10,000 for mental health, um, really. And as a father of a young man who's challenged with those issues, um, it, it tugs on my heartstrings every day um, to consider an environment that um, would help you have to go to South Florida, Central Florida. Um, what's wrong with our area? Why we can't? So our our medical school here um, has recently opined to expand in its mental health uh, operations. I just think that there ought to be a partnership consortium with Florida State and with what TMH is talking about that we can 
help in that regard. So I'd like to offer that as a strategic initiative that we give North Florida um, outlets for families who need um, mental health space for their loved ones. Thank you. Okay. So got those recorded? Got it. Good. All right. I have three. Uh, the first on the go governance support the sheriff in implementing a state, I mean, I'm sorry, step pay plan for sworn officers to achieve and maintain recruitment and retention. I talked about a little bit about that earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, second, on the quality of life, continue to explore uh, policies such as inclusionary housing and mixed housing development to increase the stock of affordable housing throughout our, our community. Talk about that as well. And finally, work with the city of Tallahassee and the ASCU School at FSU and human service agencies to utilize and refine the CHSP outcome measure measure to ensure that CHSP continues to address the highest human service needs that we have in our community. So I'll say that as well. So those are my three um, <coughs> initiatives to have. Point of information. Yes, sir. Does um, FSU's hospitality still assess and, and review uh, our tourism numbers and and so forth, they used to assist us in that regard. They don't? Okay. Okay, very good. All right, we have them up. All right, looks like we have them all up. Mr. Administrator, are you uh, we ready for go to a vote on this? You have more yes, we're ready. We're ready. And, and with all of these commissioners, again, they'll be coming back uh, after this vote. They'll be coming back uh, for formal ratification. So if we didn't get something quite right or a word or anything, they'll be coming back to you. Uh, at your commission meeting and we'll have the opportunity to provide any other direction that, that may be needed. Okay, so uh, is there a motion to approve these recommended and added oh. initiatives? Mm. Oh, yes, 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 one, one last thing. Commissioner uh, Commissioner Proctor, earlier we talked about the healthcare piece there. Uh, we asked for a minimum of 100, but staff is going to evaluate the need there and give us a good number back. So I was wondering if we could take out that minimum of 100 allowed staff just to bring that information back for, back to us. Um, Shington is nodding to yes. you. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, amend, amend, Shington. amend that piece to take that part out there, and we'll we'll let staff come back with what those numbers need to look like. Great. Yeah. Motion made by Commissioner Minor, seconded by Commissioner Welch. Any objection? Showing none, showing it's passed unanimously. Listen, we've, we've had a full day of work here, and I'm sorry I got y'all out of here an hour late, but it's been great conversation. I want to thank staff uh, for the materials they put together. I want to thank you all also for your patience. As we know, on the board, some really important issues that we have here in Leon County. Uh, but we have certainly made it through it. I'm proud of the work we did today and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and seeing what the ratification of these items look like. Mr. Administrator, you have any final words? Yes, absolutely. And commissioners, we want to, again, we want to thank you all uh, again for this strategic planning session, uh, for the vision and leadership and the clear direction that you continue to provide. I want to acknowledge all county staff, those that you heard from today, and again, uh, those that were not in the room but out there uh, doing the work. Um, I want to just very quickly especially acknowledge uh, and embarrass, hopefully, Nikki Payton, uh, Nikki works on this not only today, but throughout the year tracking all of this and, and a lot of work effort um, associated with this. So I want to thank Nikki and CMR for not only what they do today to pull this off, but in communicating all this to the to the to the broader community and that sort of thing. Commissioners, we look forward to another great year executing this strategy, improving our organizational performance and delivering big for the community. And with that, um, just thank you for all your support. Appreciate it. Great job, Mr. Chairman. Great job. All right. Good job. You got a